Hello, and welcome to the Kids and Teens stream at Watts 2020 Online. Before we turn things over to Jeff Spearglass, our host for this morning, I would like to acknowledge that Watts Toronto operates on land that is the territory of the Huron Wendat and the Paytoon First Nations, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. This territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Anishinaabeg and Allied Nations to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Tukaranto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people with long histories on this land. We are privileged to live, work, and create in this territory and strive to act with awareness and solidarity. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy, wherever you're tuning from. Now, please welcome your guest, Jeff Spearglass. Hello, Jeff. Now, hey, hey everybody. We're now, so, so prepared. Honestly, yeah. Jeff Spearglass is the author of over 20 books for young readers, including the recent Tales from Beyond the Brain series from Orca and the Countdown to Danger series from Scholastic Canada. He writes about films and film music for Rue Morgue magazine, including the just released Planet Wax classic sci-fi fantasy soundtracks on vinyl from 1984 publishing. Amazingly, he also finds the time to be a husband, a father, and a full-time classroom teacher. Yep. Follow him, if you dare, at jeffspearglass.com. I have the, the very high tech. I yep. love that, that is wonderful. So yep. I'm not gonna take up any more of your time, Jeff. I will let oh, you yeah, no go right. right into it. Welcome to all to the word on the streets. Oh my goodness, it's word from my office. And I'm, it, your guys are very lucky today because uh, I have my co-host here, Penelope the cat. Penelope, you wanna say hi? Hmm. Yeah, maybe later. All right. I wanna introduce our, our first guest today. It, and I wanna say that Elizabeth McLeod is the author of many Canadian nonfiction titles, including Canada's Close Up series. Hey, Elizabeth. Hey there. Hey. Uh, you, you've done such a range of books here. Canada's Close Up series, Canada Government, Canadian Trees, and I, oh, the Canada, uh, the money, and it's Scholastic Canada's uh, Canada Biography series. That's right. As a school teacher, I've used many of these in, in our classrooms and school. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And Canada Year by Year. And she lives in Toronto, Ontario. Yep. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Elizabeth. Great. Thanks so much for a great introduction, Jeff. And my cat Cosmo is going to be really jealous that Penelope got on screen and he's not going to do that today. No. I'm going to be talking today about my book, Meet Terry Fox. And um, everybody knows that Terry is probably Canada's greatest hero. Uh, he was born on July 28, 1958. And even as a kid, sorry, everything's backwards for me, so I'm going to have trouble here. But you can see him there. Oh, thank you. You can see him there playing um, tabletop hockey. And he loved playing all sports, uh, even when he had to play both sides against himself there. He loved uh, running around with his, his brothers and his sister. And one thing that Terry really loved was playing basketball. And here you can see him playing basketball. But you know what? When he first started playing basketball, he was really, really bad, but he loved it. So he worked really hard in grade eight. He was the worst player on the whole team, but by grade 10, he was one of the best. By grade 12, he and his best friend, Doug Allward, and he and Doug had worked really hard to get better at basketball. They were named athletes of the year at their school. So you can see how determined Terry was. Terry decided to go to university. He decided he would become a gym teacher, which kind of makes sense when he likes sports so well. And of course, he played on the basketball team. There were a lot of other people on the team who had more talent than Terry, but nobody was more determined than Terry. Terry wasn't really tall, and height can be a real help when you're playing basketball, but he worked so hard at it. So while he was in university in March of that year, when his knee started to hurt, he thought that was just because of the basketball that he was playing. But you know what? It wasn't. It was because he had cancer. He found out he had cancer in his knee and he was going to have to have his right leg amputated from just above the knee. 
he was really upset. He cried. I, I think I would too. And on the night before Terry's uh, operation, his high school basketball coach, there he is there, dropped by. He brought Terry an article about a runner who'd also lost his leg above the knee and then had gone on to run a marathon. So a marathon is 42 kilometers long. When most people run a marathon, they train really hard for weeks, months leading up to that. And then after the marathon, they relax and they, they get rested up because it takes a lot out of you. It's really, really hard work. Terry thought to himself, if that guy can run with one leg, so can I. And his coach said, I know you've got the determination. Terry wanted to prove that losing his leg wouldn't stop him. But running one marathon wasn't enough. Remember what I just said about how hard marathons are? Three weeks after Terry's leg was amputated, he was fitted with an artificial leg, you can see it here, and he was trying to walk. That was really hard. So what Terry was left with was like a stump of his right leg. It fitted into a bucket on the artificial leg, but at first it didn't fit really well. It was, it was hard to make it work. So it was often bleeding. Terry would end up with sores. He would end up with blisters. It was, it was really hard, but you know, Terry, he was determined, he kept going. Meanwhile, Terry was getting chemotherapy to destroy any cancer cells that were in his body. The drugs he were given at the cancer clinic, so here he is, made him feel sick. That happens to a lot of people. It also made his hair fall out. There's Terry right there. I'm going to see if I can get it in close. And you can see he's wearing a baseball cap because he doesn't have any hair on his head. And he really hated that. There were many other patients at the clinic. Some of them were in pain or they were even dying. You can see some of them there. Terry wanted to do something for them. Everyone's so brave, he thought. What can I do to help? So Terry decided to raise money for cancer research. How was he going to do that? Well, Terry kept trying to get better. In fact, he even started running when he felt healthy enough. He trained longer and longer, and then he put together all those thoughts he'd had in his head about raising money for cancer research, about running more than one marathon. Here he is talking with his friend Doug. Remember I mentioned him before? And he said, Doug, I want to run all the way across Canada, all the way from Newfoundland to Vancouver to raise money for cancer research. And the way I'm going to do it is to run a marathon every single day. Remember I told you how hard marathons are? Terry wanted to do one every day. Well, Terry knew that would take a lot of help from Doug and from other people. So he started writing away to companies to ask for their support. He needed money for meals along the way. He wanted any money that he raised, he wanted that to go to cancer research. He didn't want to use it for himself. So he asked for help from companies. He was going to go through a lot of running shoes, you can imagine, um, and all the running things like running um, socks, everything. And he wrote away to companies and he said, my plan is to run across Canada to raise money for cancer research. I'm not a dreamer, but I believe in miracles. I have to. He rode away to Ford of Canada, and they gave him this van, which became known as the Marathon of Hope van. You can see it there with all the signage on it. That was really important. Terry needed something else, a driver for that van, and that was going to be his friend Doug. They were such good friends. Doug, uh, Terry knew that Doug could get him through any hard days, because when you're running a marathon a day, there probably are going to be some hard days. Doug, because he was an athlete, he also knew how to deal with injuries, and, uh, and he was also a really good driver. So on April 12th, 1980, Terry dipped his foot into the very cold gray water of the Atlantic Ocean just off St. John's, Newfoundland, and he started the Marathon of Hope. So that's April. The water was really, really cold. But if you take a look, Terry's wearing shorts. Terry did that a lot during his run, um, and that was because he really wanted people to see his artificial leg. He wanted people to think about what people with cancer go through. So it was really important to Terry that people see his leg like that. Here are Doug and Terry on the road, and they would usually start the day at around 4.30 in the morning. That's really, really early. 
And when they en ended the day, Terry would find a really distinctive rock or he'd find something by the side of the road, like a, a plastic bag to put under the rock. And that would mark where he had ended that night. The next morning when he started again, he made sure he touched that marker so that he didn't miss a centimeter along the whole way that he was running. Some days when Terry was running, he was running in blizzards. And look, there's Terry in sweatpants because it's so cold. He couldn't wear shorts that day. But some days it was incredibly, incredibly hot. Some days Terry was running through winds that almost blew him over. Some days it was really, really rainy. At first, most people didn't really know about Terry's run, and they didn't know what this guy was doing running on the side of highways. They'd almost run him over. Um, and in New Brunswick, Terry's brother, Daryl, joined them on the trip. So there's Doug, there's Terry, there's Daryl. So you've got three young guys living out of a van. Sometimes they spent the night in the van if they couldn't find anywhere else. Remember I talked about those socks of Terry's and all his running clothes? Well, they would get pretty smelly after all that time. So sometimes that back of the van was pretty stinky. Here's Terry running along, and you can see there's nobody else on the road with him. Some days, no, at first, nobody knew what he was doing. He didn't get a lot of publicity, and that was really hard because he was out there to try to raise money for cancer research, and if there was nobody watching him, that was really tough because he wasn't raising money. But that was about to really change. When Terry crossed from Quebec into Ontario, people really started to notice what he was doing. See all the people standing on the side of the road? They would stand there for hours, hoping to catch a glimpse of him coming by. And uh, they would give him lots of money. They would give all of the volunteers who were taking up uh, money from him, um, lots of donations, which was great. And here's Terry in July in 1980. He's in Toronto, where I am, where Word on the Street usually takes place on the streets of Toronto. Lots and lots of people came out to City Hall to hear Terry talk. Cancer has given me courage and a sense of purpose I never had before, Terry said. But you don't have to wait until you lose a leg to find out what you're really made of. You can start now. And if you notice, there's Terry in his shorts, but he's also wearing a hockey jersey. So I think of Terry as one of Canada's greatest heroes, but Terry also had heroes. One of his heroes was Daryl Sittler, a hockey player, and he met Daryl Sittler on this day, and Daryl Sittler gave him his jersey. Another really big hero of Terry's was another hockey player, superstar Bobby Orr, and Terry also got to meet Bobby Orr. On this one day in Toronto, Terry raised over $100,000, and I think you can imagine that must have made him feel really, really great. He kept running, but some days he would take some time off to meet with other people. And here he is with a 10 year old boy named Greg Scott. And Terry and Greg had one thing in common. They had both lost a leg to cancer. So they knew what the other one was going through and they had a really good time together swimming in a lake and you can see them there. Terry kept running. And by September 1st, 1980, so that's just over 40 years ago, he was just outside Thunder Bay, but it wasn't a good day. Terry started to feel real pains in his neck and in his chest. When Terry had felt pain before, he, he kept running. That's what he really did to deal with pain, but it was just too much. Terry couldn't keep running. He went to the hospital, and there they found that his cancer had spread to his lungs. He was going to have to stop his run. We got to go home, he said. All I can say is that if there's any way I can get out there and finish, I will. Terry went back home to, New Brun uh, to British Columbia. He started chemotherapy again. While he was getting chemotherapy, he, was, he received lots of awards. Here he is ma being made a companion of the Order of Canada. That's Canada's highest honor. I think you'd agree he deserved it. He was also the youngest person to ever receive it. He also won the Lou Marsh Trophy, and that's for Canada's Athlete of the Year. And that was really important to Terry because he loves sports so much. People kept donating to the Marathon of Hope even after Terry stopped running. And in February, his dream of raising a dollar for every Canadian came true. So that was $24 million. But the drugs he was taking to fight his cancer weren't working, and he got weaker and weaker. On June 28, 1981, Terry died.
the whole country mourned the loss of this really brave hero. But we didn't forget about him because later that year was the very first Terry Fox run. And maybe you've taken part in one of these runs. And if you have, thank you. Between Terry's work and your work and all the other runners all around the world, not just in Canada anymore, people have raised more than $780 million for, um, for cancer research. This book about Terry Fox is just one of the books in a series that I've worked on. And the people in the series all have three things in common. And one of the things is they were all born in Canada. So this is Viola Desmond. You can see her on the $10 bill. Jeff, you've seen her too there. She was born in Halifax. Yeah. She's amazing. This is Tom Longboat. He was born on the Six Nations Reserve just outside Brantford, Ontario. Another thing about these people is that they were really determined. So Elsie McGill was determined to become an aeronautical engineer. What's that? So an aeronautical engineer is, is somebody who designs planes and builds planes as well. Elsie was not only the first female in Canada to become an aeronautical engineer, she was the first in the whole world. Willie O'Ree was determined to play hockey in the National Hockey League. Just one problem. He was playing the 1950s and his skin color, he was black, um, was a problem. But 1958, he became the very first black hockey player in the NHL. Just two more. Um, oh, yeah. The, the right. other thing, oh, there's Penelope again. The no. other thing about these people is that they were all ordinary kids, just like you, who grew up to do extraordinary things. Chris Hadfield wanted to become an astronaut when he was a kid. Just one problem, Canada didn't have a space program, but Chris grew up to be Canada's most famous astronaut ever. And who would have known when he was a kid that he would become such an extraordinary adult? And of course, Terry, when he was young, he was just a kid who loved sports, but he grew up to do something extraordinary. So you may think that you're just an ordinary kid, but you may grow up to be, do something extraordinary. And if you do, I want you to contact me so I can write your biography too. So oh. thank you so much. I really liked writing about Terry Fox. I love talking about him and I hope you learned a bit more about him. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, Elizabeth. I mean, I'm, I've used a lot of those books in our, in our school. Oh, great. They're a great way to expose some of these great Canadians to young people and really summarize their lives and you know a lot of the messages behind their stories such as you know in Terry's case perseverance and goal setting that yeah. that's really inspirational so thank you so much for yet another entry in that series thank you uh, Jeff thank you Penelope thanks you <laughs> <laughs> uh and I'm gonna have to say we're gonna have to say goodbye uh and then introduce our next guest I thank you for your great reading and your great your great presentation yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Have a good day, everybody. Take care. Enjoy Word on the Street. All right. Oh, the sunshine is coming, at least where I am in, in Kitchener, Ontario. And now I'm getting these great vertical slats of light in my face. It's not going to stop me from introducing our next, our next presenter, uh, Bob Bartell. And Bob served as the regional coordinator for the... Oh, hey, Bob. Can you hear me? Hi, how are you? I'm good. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, totally. Well, that's two I'm, people yeah. that have good hearing. Yeah. Uh, so I hear you were the regional coordinator for the Mennonite Central Committee in Happy Valley, Labrador from 1986 to 89. Yes. And that was a life altering experience Correct. for you. And I, my under, we that's learned that during that, sorry? During that time, I you was agreeing with you. Yeah. The Innu struggle against the NATO supersonic flight training. And that's where we got the germ of your story, uh, Nanis's story, which you got from her aunt and is used with permission. And Bob, you're coming to us live from Saskatoon. Is that right? Correct. All right. Yes. So I would love to turn things over to you to share a little bit about uh, 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 Natui's Cap and uh, the great book that you've put together. Well, thank you. I uh, want to thank Words on the Street for this opportunity to talk about my book, Nadawi's Cap. And uh, the title, Nadawi's Cap, means my father's cap. And the book was co-published uh, by the Inu Education Board and running the Goat Press out of Tours, out of Tours Cove in Newfoundland. 
Now, this is not my story. It is the story of the Inu people of Labrador. And as such, all my royalties will go to a scholarship fund set up by the Inu Education Board. Yudawi's cap comes from a time of turbulence, a time of pain, a time of courage, a time of despair, a time of challenge and creativity. And during the 18, 1980s, CBC television would broadcast to the entire nation that the Inu had protested again on the runways of Goose Bay and forcing the NATO nations to temporarily stop their low-level flights over the Inu homeland they called Natasanan. Whole families would come, elders with canes, mothers with children in their arms, and a raft of children. Teenagers set up tents on the bombing range to stopping bombing practice for days. The hundreds of charges tied up the courts while no, when no one would translate. There were visits from other Aboriginal groups, Quebec Inu, a CSIS agent who wandered around, government officials, David Suzuki and other media, filmmakers like National Film Board, film documentaries, and writers came and wrote books like Marie Wadden uh, did of Natas and them. Now, Natawi's cap is a true story of a young girl, Nanas, and it's set against the backdrop of Innu community protests over the NATO low-level flights over their traditional lands in eastern Quebec and Labrador. The Innu were among the last remaining nomadic Canadian First Nations, being before being pressured to settle in the communities in the mid-60s. Our family was in Goose Base from 1986 to 89 under the auspices of Mennonite Central Committee. As we built relationships with the Inu people, we became involved in their struggles with the protests against NATO flights. The low-level flight protests began in 87, and the new Tawish cap story occurred in about 1988. On the morning of the protests, document documented on in the Dawi's cap, the Inu created a razor, Inu crossed a razor wire fence and walked on the runway. That night, Nanas watched as the police arrested her father and other Inu leaders. Nanas carried her father's cap home for comfort. Her aunt told me the story the following morning and it has stuck with me for 30 years. I sent an early draft to a friend of mine, uh, Camille Fouillard, who I had met during the protests. Camille Fouillard, who unbeknownst to me, was then the Inu Director of Education. And another surprise was that she worked with Nanas in the Cheshire School. Camille had discussions with Nanas and other Inu leaders and a different vision for the book developed. The book became longer, was translated into two dialects of the Inu language, contained a glossary of every new word used in the story, a map, and because the story was 30 years old, a historical backgrounder. Camille assembled translators, the publisher, illustrator, and wrote the background. Without her, there would be no book. Now the book has the honor of having an acclaimed Inu artist, Mary Ann Panashaway do the illustrations. Now, Mary Ann started painting at age 30 when her husband bought her a set of paints for her birthday. Many of her paintings graced the walls of, Cheshish, of the Cheshire School and, uh, and other public buildings. And she has had art shows in St. John's in Ottawa. One of her paintings has been acquired by the rooms a prestigious permanent collection of Newfoundland art in St. John's. Marion comes with the, from the Inu culture and depicts it in her art. And she also participated in these protests. So she is an ideal person to, to, uh, to uh, do the illustrations. Now, if you buy this book, you will have veritable, a, a veritable, um, gallery of her paintings. 
I'll tell you a couple of my favorite ones. This one is the story shows her fishing with her father. And my favorite one shows her sleeping with the calf at the end of the story. And that says her father wore the Inu Nation cap all the time. And I made a facsimile here. And you can see that it has an Inu flag stitched onto it. And uh, you'll notice on the flag are two caribou skulls, a snowshoe, and the green, white, and blue of nature in Labrador. Now, 2019 was the year of the indigenous languages. All indigenous languages are in danger of disappearing. So because this book has the two dialects of Inu, uh, or the story translated into those two dialects, they will be used in schools in Natushish and Cheshishi to help with language skills. And you know, there's also an extensive glossary at the back. Now, the Inu speak in two dialects, the north and the south. And in the center you'll, of the book, uh, of the, any page, you will find the English translation. I use some words, Inu words, in the English section, like atik, which is caribou, uh, mask, which is bear, nisk, which is goose, namesh, which is fish and the Dawi, which means my father. Now during this, our stay, five NATO nations practice low level fine over Labrador because the landscape, the landscape was similar to the Soviet Union. The planes practiced flying low so as not to be detected by rear. And they flew close to the speed of sound so you wouldn't hear the jets until they were upon you and it created dangers for people in canoes and animals. The government was seeking to increase the number for flights from 6,500 to 40,000 per year by establishing a tactical fighter and weapons training center. And it was to include live bombs and the Inu could not tolerate that. So now why do I want to tell you a story that is 30 years old? Why is it important? I feel that many advances in our society will require the urgency of nonviolent protests, such as eradicating racism, dealing with the issues of climate change and poverty. The new protests present a model of nonviolent action that was effective in showing the world the cost and the power of the strategy. They went as families, which helped ensure nonviolence and only a minimal property damage occurred. And through the protest, elders passed down their values from one generation to another. The land was important. The culture was important. The animals were important. And they were able to delay the tactical fighter and weapons training center long enough until the military strategy changed. And the low level flights changed to flights by drones. Now you can visit my website at www.bobbartell.com for a lot more information and you'll be able to see uh, videos of flights. Now I'd like to read the first part of my story. The Dowie's cap. Can I go fishing with you, Nuta? Can I? I scramble for my for the fishing gear the hook and the line wrapped around the carnation milk tin. We've been here two months and it's my turn to catch a Namesh. You're 10 years old, Nanak, Natawi said. It's time. Every Inu needs to learn to fish. I bounced on the fur boughs that made up the tent's floor, then pulled Nadawi through the doorway. Nadawi grabbed his well-worn blue Inu nation ball cap on the way out. The Inu flag on the front showed the world where he belonged. Burying my hand in his strong grip, 
I skipped to Natalie's favorite fishing spot, where where the shallow shallow water curled around rocks and wind blew away black flies. Sitting on a large rock at river's edge, Nadawi taught me to bait the hook, cast the line, and bring it in. And the mesh soon took the bait. Hang on, bring it in slowly, Nadawi encouraged. Then, then the mesh fought hard, but we reeled it in. I wanted to run and tell Nadawi and Nukum right away. First, you must give thanks to Mishinak, the water spirit, for giving us the Nimesh, Nadawi said. After giving thanks, Nadawi and I hooked the slippery Nimesh to a stick and carried it to camp. You're not getting away, I said. You're invited for supper. Nadawi laughed. Look what I caught, Nikai. I shouted, entering the tent. It's an enormous Nimesh, Nadawi said proudly as she and Nukum prepared a meal. I guess we'll be having a mesh. Bikichi can. The family sat around the crackling campfire. Smells of frying fish and burning wood were filled the air. It was mine a mesh, so I ate extra. It tasted delicious. Nukum told stories of her land we call Natesanen. The Dawi spoke of mask and ishk and especially a teak. And without warning, a deafening boom drove it to the ground. Even Udawi, I heard my heart pound hard against my chest. Seconds later, another ear-splitting blast struck us. I screamed and ran to hide in the tent. Nakawi and Nukum ran after me. It's the jets, Nakawi said, holding me tight, her eyes showing her fear. They were so low, I said. They almost touched the trees. The animals must be afraid too. What if we were in a canoe, Nakawi worried. I looked at Nadawi. He was muttering. His fists clenched tightly. This isn't right, Nudawi said. The government won't listen. They want jets to practice bombing over our land. This campsite in Mesonipi is inside their bombing range. Talking to them is useless. These flights will continue. It isn't safe. We're packing up. We broke camp and headed back to our village, Sheshishi. Nudawi called a meeting of all the Inu elders. And after the meeting, Nadawi came home. His face was serious. What did you decide? I asked him. Canada is not listening to us. We will walk on the airport runway so the jets will not fly, Nadawi said. Can I come too? I asked. The young and the old must all walk, Nadawi said. We must protect our future, our land and animals. When the time came, whole families, old and young, including me, walked through the gates and crawled over metal fences. We grounded the jets. Police took us off the runway in buses, but we came back again and again. We gathered, walked on the runways, and stopped the jets. So that's the first part of the story, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, and get yourself some a new art by Marianne Panashway. Yeah, it's it's a really powerful story that you've uh, managed to put together, Bob. Um, you know, and one of the things that first struck me was that it, it is it does share those um, uh, the two Inu dialects that is really important uh, when we think about language and trying to preserve the language in some capacity. How did you go about uh, putting that aspect of the book together? Initially, I didn't realize there were two dialects of the Inu language. I only thought there, thought of the Sheshishi one, and I assumed they were the same. Um, but because I was working with Camille Fouillard, who was uh, a friend of mine, but was working with the Inu and was working with the Inu, the was the director of Inu education. She was able to put all this together, and 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 develop the story. And the publisher, Running the Goat, was very amenable to making a book longer because it's more expensive to do these books that way. And uh, so I was fortunate to, to deal with her. Do we know how many people are currently speaking Inu in here in Canada? Well, in Labrador, there's 3,000. Mm -hmm. There's 3,000. There's 3,000 in... Um, there's about a thousand in Mutushis and about two thousand in 
in uh, Sheshishi. Those are the two communities in Labrador. Right. Uh, and I also really also appreciated the the um, the glossary in the back, which, as you mentioned, is quite extensive and goes through a lot of vocabulary. Um, do we know for you know a lot of the community these indigenous communities where there I know there are quite a few children's books uh, where the language is 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 in the book and they're they're in, they're bilingual or in some cases multilingual. Um, do we know how these are used? Do they get to be used in classrooms and schools? And if they're helpful in in trying to maintain languages and maintain culture? Well, one thing that Camille did was she ensured there were multiple copies for both the schools in Labrador. And uh, so they are used uh, by the schools for language as well as for uh, for uh, a historical lesson. This is the only book they have at this level in their own language that, uh, that talks about this portion of their history and it's only 30 years old. Yeah. So it's very important because it changed the people. I mean, I was there in March 2019 and the uh, community is considerably different. And uh, the, the, a, lot of, a lot of people are uh, very, very strong. And this, this process helped them become strong. Yeah, I wonder if, you know, our work in Truth and Reconciliation has helped to foster a lot of these communities and, uh, and to make sure that, you know, everybody gets the things that they need. Um, and the book is really lovely. It was really lovely to look at the art specifically, uh, was, was quite beautiful. Um, do you have any other stories that you're looking to tell? from your time and from the, the people that you've met? Um, I'm quite an eclectic writer. I have stories about my dog, about my mother, uh, you know, and about fanciful situations when you have a child from, from a Sasquatch and, uh, and a human relationship and he goes to see relatives and the problems that occur. So I, I I write uh, a lot of stories. Uh, this is the first one that's been um, made out into a book. All right. I'm, I'm actually looking at our time, and I think that's probably all the time we have uh, for you for today, Bob. But thank you so much for coming and sharing and sharing the story and, uh, and your experiences. I certainly learned a lot from it. So I hope you have a great day. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Bye. Bye. Take care. All right. Welcome back to uh, the home office. Uh, well, for some of you in Toronto, for me, it's in Kitchener. And of course, you're uh, watching Word on the Street. We've got we've got Penelope. Who uh, Penelope? How are you doing? So no words from this cat. Don't you? Aren't you going to tell them your magic words? No, she's not. I want to. Uh, Penelope is not going to tell much. I just want to do a couple of quick things I want to introduce and just mention that a lot of the books from today's speakers, you can find them uh, at elamino.ca. I think, oh, and there it is at the bottom of, yeah, you know, you can see the neatly printed version or this one here, you, and you can find a lot of the books that you've been hearing about right there. I want to introduce our, uh, our next uh, presenter. Um, Hassan Namir was born in Iraq in 1987. Hi, Hassan. How are you? Oh, hi, Jeff. Good. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, awesome. You can hear me. I can hear you. Yeah, all good, for sure. Always a plus, right? <laughs> uh, and so I understand you came to Canada at a young age. Yeah. Uh, you graduated from Simon Fraser University with a BA in English. Uh, and then your first novel, uh, God in Pink, won the Lambda Literary Award for Gay Fiction in 2016. And you have a poetry book called War Torn as well. Uh -huh. Yeah. With book hug, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think what's funny, we're doing this westward movement of our hosts. So Elizabeth's in Toronto and Bob's in Saskatoon, and you're coming to us from Vancouver. Correct. Yeah, earlier in the morning for you. Oh, yeah, but it's worth it for sure. <laughs> All right, well, I'm not going to say anything more. I want to throw it over to you and to share a little bit about uh, your book, The Name I Call Myself. Yeah, for sure. Um, this is my book, The Name I Call Myself. Um, what we'll do, I'll just read a couple pages from it and then 
maybe we can discuss a little bit. Um, so the illustrations is by Catherine John, um, who is a wonderful illustrator, and it's published by Arsenal Paul Press. They also published my first book, God in Pink, as well. So what I'll do, I'm going to read the text, and then I'll show you the illustration that corresponds with it. And I'm going to read a couple pages from it. The name I call myself. My name is written in front of me. I try to say it over and over again. When I think of the name Edward, I imagine old kings who snore a lot. It is a name my parents gave me, but I call myself something else. I am six. I like playing with dolls. They are awesome superheroes. My dad cuts my hair so short. He says, this is what a boy looks like. I am seven. I idolize my mom. I especially love the way she wears lipstick. I have an imaginary friend. They care about me more than anyone else. I am eight. All my friends are girls. We have sleepovers and watch princess movies. My mom says she wishes she had a girl. Sometimes I wish I were a girl too. I am nine. I want to have long wavy hair. I want to look like the stars on TV. My dad says, you're a boy, so you have to act like one. Yes, I'm a boy, I'm a boy, I'm a boy. I'll read two more pages here. I am 10. I play a lot of hockey, but at home, I put on my mom's dresses. My mom finds out, so I cry. She says, next time, just ask first. And I'll read one more page here. I am 11. I hate my voice so much. It cracks and breaks, especially when I'm nervous. I'm so embarrassed and scared. I don't have anyone I can talk to. Okay, and I'll stop right here. Thanks for sharing that with us, Hassan. Um, Thanks so much, Jeff. Yeah, it's 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 a really powerful book, um, and you know, Thank you. I think also that the the illustrations are you know very powerful as well. When one is doing a picture book, and I have tried and failed many times, um, you know, it, it's finding the balance between text and image, and and it, it you know it. The story is a story of self-discovery and acceptance and, and you know, love for oneself. And I'm just curious about the journey to, to put that book together and for that audience. For sure. Um, I mean, I've had this idea as long as I can remember. Um, you know, I was born in Iraq um, and growing up, I felt I've always felt different. Um, so, you know, I grew up in an environment where it's like either you're a boy or you're a girl. Um, so it's all, you know, it's the, the binaries and conformity. And um, I, I, grew, I grew up feeling that I was in between. Like I felt like I could, you know, I played with dolls and um, I was, I just always felt that I was different. So I've had this idea for as long as I can remember. Um, I mean, it took, you know, quite a few years um, until, you know, once I became a writer and, and all that. And it was always just in the back of my mind. And so, um, so how it works is that I wrote the manuscript first. And then I was looking for illustrators. Um, my friend Alex suggested her friend, Catherine uh, John, and um, we clicked right away. Like um, she, she just had all these amazing ideas and um, in terms of like form and just like how like the illustration can, you know, complement 
the, the writing. And um, yeah, and we just, she sent me a couple of samples and I really loved like her work. And then um, I approached Brian Lam at Arsenal Paul Press. I sent him the manuscript and um, and he and he loved it. And um, and then uh, we started working together. And I, I, I asked him if I could uh, just work with Catherine John as the illustrator, and he agreed to that. They uh, saw some sample of her work, and um, you know they had a lot of ideas as well. And so it was like a quite a collaboration process between myself and Catherine, as well as like everybody at Arsenal Paul Press. Everybody has there's so much passion um, like oozing out of from everybody. So it was quite wonderful to work with people who believe in the work, and um, they have all these wonderful ideas. So so it's sort of like a conversation that. Catherine and I had. I um, I wanted I left I wanted the writing to complement the the illustration. So I didn't want, like want too much like writing. I let let it like you know less is more kind of thing. And then the illustration sort of elevated the the writing itself. So yeah, like it's definitely one of the best collaborations um, I've worked with. And um, I really hope you know this is just one book of many children's book in the future for me. So. Okay. Yeah, are there are there other projects that you would like to work on, like for a young audience, like uh, like this one here? Is there are yeah. there any other projects that you're perhaps developing together? Yeah, I'm I'm working on a a book called a Yellow Dream right now, so um, I'm just working on the manuscript. So yeah, I definitely hope to write more and more. Um, a couple of people asked for a, who read the book wanted a sequel, so um, that idea I love that idea. So I'll, I'm definitely going to work on that as well and uh, come up with other books. You know. Uh, continue the story of Ari. So something that I definitely want to work on for sure. Nice. I mean, one of the things that um, I thought is, is interesting when you're mentioning is just about your ability to collaborate with your artist uh, at the time of putting the project together. It's uh, often I get people asking me, you know, I have a book and I have I did the pictures or my friend did the pictures and I have the text and what do I do? And I often will tell them like most publishers will just want the text and they'll have their own um, their own idea of who they want to illustrate it. And I'm always I'm always very excited to see any visual that accompanies a book. I mean, someone's take on what I'm trying to do in text. Um, so it must be, I'm just curious about the process of working together through through this book and you know how you would have worked back and forth because I never get that opportunity. Uh, what was that like for the two of you? Yeah, for sure. And like you said, uh, a lot of like, especially children's book publishers, they would, um, you know, you just provide the text and they had their own um, illustrators. Mm -hmm. But I, in this case, I really insisted that I work with Catherine because I just, you know, we, we see eye to eye and, and I knew, so I, I asked Brian if we could wor uh, work with her and, and he agreed because they saw uh, like sample uh, illustrations that, and, you know, and they, they really liked it. So, uh, so how it works basically, yeah, we, we did a lot of Skype, like uh, it was all through Skype. I mean, she's local as well, but um, we just, uh, you know, uh, through Skype and uh, she would send me like a couple samples and, um, you know, like how she envisioned it. And um, and then, you know, I'd be like, oh, this works, this, you know, like, and then all that. And, uh, and then we would send it to like Arsenal. So like they had like a, rough uh you know for the illustration the con all the concepts and everything and then they, they they put in their you know ideas like they said oh this works this doesn't work they, they would like to see it a bit more uh vivid and um and then catherine just blew out of the park she came back with uh, like just exactly what they wanted so she was def definitely so wonderful to work with um very always available whenever it needed to be and uh so just as passionate as i am so it was just wonderful as well to work with that so we would um then you know work through the rough draft they you know arsenal would have like um ideas and um and thoughts and then she would go back you know work again and and, and then come back and then we sent them the the sample illustrations with the text um and of course with the text itself i also worked with shiroz wolinski um our amazing editor at arsenal pop press so we worked on editing it you know and making sure it's you know as best as it can be um uh, while while like Catherine was also working on the illustration. So was a, there was a lot of um, things happening at the same time. And yeah, and then um, and then at, at the end it all just came together and it was quite wonderful. Nice. Uh, I like that you mentioned the editor as well. I know that we always get the author and the illustrator's names on the front of the book. And I've, I've just been a firm believer that, you know, the editors are the unsung heroes uh, who don't always get the credit that they deserve. They do an amazing job. Um, just not to take away from the author, but just, 
you know, the role of, of editing. And I think even as a classroom teacher, you know, the mm-hmm. idea that you can go back and fix your, your mistakes and, and not just mistakes, but fix, fix the text so that it, it is the best possible version of the text it can be. Uh, I'm curious for you how in a book where the text is quite, uh, I'm saying minimal in that it, it, you know, the illustrations enhance, you know, yeah. their simple aspects, I guess, probably they're taken from your personal experience. How was it, how hard was it to kind of choose these key, key themes and key ideas for you and to distill it in a picture book like this? Yeah, like uh, working on, like with, you know, Cheryl, she would have like, I- like ideas. She was like comments on, you know, this, this, we can maybe change it, how we can make it for perhaps make it a little bit um, less dark. Sometimes the text was a bit dark at times. So we wanted just to, how we could, um, you know, work on that. So like make sure that there's a structure. So there's like, um, you know, a, a story and a conflict and an ending. So that was something that uh, we worked on as Kind of put it in a stru- uh, you know structural format um so the text originally had um didn't have have that so working with shiro's uh she was wonderful in the sense that she she brought out the that that structure so she made sure that you know this text would would complement one another and it was even though like uh it's it may come up as simple but there's also there's a story so there's a beginning middle and end mm-hmm. so um so yeah she would um, have comments on that and um, you know and uh even including the title uh the original title for example was called neither but then well, her and i worked together and she had title suggestions and then we came up with the title the name i call myself so the same with the text as well so there were uh, parts where we made some changes to the text just to make sure that it, it flows so um, that it's all about the flow so this idea of like if you notice in the text like I am like for the ages um, I am 11 I am 8 so so we had a sort of like a almost like a, not chapter headings but like just a flow to it so that it um, so that, that it um, you know seemed all concise you know um, and that was something that was always uh, you know working with shows she brought that she brought the that uh, out of the text and um, yeah, like you said, they are the unsung hero. Like she's she's wonderful. Mm-hmm. And I, it, you know, it, it's a, such a personal book and a personal like exploration of your own childhood. I mean, how long did it take you to kind of uh, you know just be able to? I, you mentioned like this is a, a book that you've had in you for a long time. Um, did you always see doing it as a picture book for young readers to to help them? I mean, I guess, you know, the impetus for the book and to, to make it be what it was, like, how did that, well, I guess, how did that work for you and how, how long did it take you to get to that point where you wanted specifically a picture book for young readers? For sure. So um, I think it was, it was a couple of years ago when I wanted to uh, decide that it should be like a children's book. Um, so um, for, for me, originally, I was going to do like... Um, I, I had a couple, like, uh, you know, some of my poems and War Torn, for example, talks about, you know, that idea of like, you know, um, self and my gender identities and everything. So, so I had, and also there's a bit of that also in God in Pink as well. Uh, but, but yeah, for, uh, for me, it was the whole, that story idea was, um, came when I um, decided to write it as a children's book itself. So uh, it, um, it, it was a couple of years ago. I've always, I mean, I've always wanted to write a children's book, but um, I just wasn't sure when. Um, I mean, I, for, I just started, like my, my first book was in 2015. So that was when I got into the publishing world. So, so I was, I'm still pretty new to it, but, um, but yeah, like for me, it was like just the last couple of years is when I had this idea. And, um, and I think the way I, the way I saw it is I think the reason why I decided for it to be a children's book, because I wanted to have, um, a book that is like a, a sanctuary, a safe haven for non-binary kids, as well as not just non-binary kids, kids who feel that they're different or kids that don't have any friends or um, or kids that go through what kids go through. Like, for example, in the book, you know, the idea of like pimples and like, you know, like that uh, raspy voice. So it's so it's just it's things that any any child could relate to. So so the way I the way I decided to do it is through children's book to kind of offer a message of hope, you know, um, for for not only um, the, the non-binary kids and all, all kids out there and their allies and their friends and, and their families. So they can at least see um, through the perspective, like Ari's perspective here. And um, and I think that's why I decided I think it's important to start um, in, the, in that uh, genre, like, you know, for, for children and to you know to have that kind of message of hope um and self-acceptance i think it's very important for sure yeah and you know i know that it's it's 
you know, as, as it's kind of like a burgeoning field within children's picture books too. I know we have been looking through libraries for similar material for our own children. Uh, and just to, to make sure, you know, as you say, you know, at the beginning of your talk, you know, a boy is a boy and a girl is a girl, but like that, that limits other people in terms of how they might identify and Absolutely. also, yeah. And also how they might see themselves. So, I mean, books like these, you know, do a real service to, to young people who might have trouble trying to see themselves in the material. Have you had a chance to share this with a lot of young readers? And if so, have you been able to get their response to it? Um, well, the book is technically not out yet. It's, oh, it's going to be, yeah. <laughs> but um, I mean, they can, people can, yeah, people can still order. Like it, it is available now. Like it's, it's uh, slowly, but the actual date is October thirteenth. Um, but, um, but I've already like, yeah, like. Um, there's been readers like um, you know on Twitter, people will tweet like for example, um, this lady and her kids were were saying that they you know they love the book and um, and everything and uh, so yeah like it's 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 slowly uh, starting to um, and hopefully yeah it will be more and more I I hope that um, kids will connect with it somehow whether they see themselves in Ari or they see themselves through like you know as as an ally or a friend yeah. to somebody like our Ari because because like, like I said this book is for you know everybody I um it's it's especially I hope it's a message to, to the allies out there you know like that they that they might have friends that are like Ari that they can actually you know empathize with and um, you know and help you know uh, as well so that so that they, there's no they don't feel any lonely and um, and then they have friends out there that um, love them for who they are you know yeah no, and I hope, uh, yeah, you know, I know we have to wrap up in a second. Uh, actually, wait, where's Paula? She's she's on the chat, and I I want to confirm that you know I know you're saying it's not quite out yet, but I'm just curious if our online vendor Elemental Books hopefully will carry it. Um, that be so where where else can we find this book? So if we go look for sure, up. yeah. So you can uh, order um, directly from Arsenal Pop's website www.arsenalpop.com and I believe it will also be like um, you know uh, your local independent bookstore and local bookstores I believe it's it's slowly um, like I, I think it is on uh, that uh, website as well so it is yeah Illumina and um, yeah and it will be available um, soon and also all the major bookstores um, starting October as well awesome well I'm gonna keep my eyes peeled for that one uh, thank, you so thank you so much for taking some time to share your story and your experience with us. Uh, it was awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. I appreciate it. Thanks so much All for right. having me. Take, Take care. care. You too. Bye bye. All right. Oh, somebody is uh, getting a little uh, lazy on the job. Do you want to read the next uh, the next notes, uh, Penelope? Penel Penelope. It's embarrassing. Oh my goodness. All right. Well, fine. Penelope the cat's not going to introduce our next uh, our next guest. Then I guess that will be me. Um, I want to introduce uh, Adam and Jennifer Young to uh, to, uh, to Word on the Street. Uh, they live. Wait, wait. This has been like. Hey guys, how are you doing? Hello. Hey. Hi. I'm sorry, Penelope the cat is not being. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hard to find good help. Oh, you know, I heard this, but <laughs> hello. This I don't know if anybody noticed. We have Spooky the cat here. Oh my goodness! He's been oh my the whole time, Spooky. <laughs> they were actually gonna have the cats be the host, and then they they yeah. <laughs> cats didn't do it. I had to do it. So you guys are joining us from uh, Fogo Island, Newfoundland. Yes, we are. Yeah. Wow, we've had like a coast to coast representation for. Word on the Street Toronto, which I've posted a few years in a row. It never happens that, you know, everybody's a local author. It's great that we can have people from across the country. Yeah. Uh, but you live there with your two daughters and your dog, Johnny Cash. Yeah. We do, yeah. He's here somewhere, creeping around. He's creeping around here. <laughs> well, Johnny Cash is welcome to join. Uh, the first <laughs> <laughs> so, Adam, you're an accomplished visual artist, and you're known for your original, whimsical, and vividly colorful depictions of Eastern Canada. Uh, which I have to say, I looked through a copy, a PDF of the book. It's beautiful. Um, Thank you. Makes me want to go back to the East Coast. We're there every summer. Uh, yeah. And I actually love looking at, at fishing huts. So it was nice to have a look through this book and make me have warm feelings for our Eastern <laughs> Canada. 
I will be, I would like to turn everything over to you guys to share a little bit about your book, um, The Little Red Shed. Yeah. Yeah. So we, uh, this is the book here, if anyone hasn't seen it yet. So uh, yeah, it's a, a little book we've been working on for a few years now. Uh, we're both former teachers, so uh, we've always wanted to kind of join together. She's uh, obviously the the brains behind it, and the, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was a perfect kind of uh, team of uh, both me and her, me doing the art and her doing the words. So we wanted to do it for a few years, and we kind of hashed it out, and finally we we decided to uh, to go ahead with it. So yeah, yeah, yes. Um, actually, I. I also am uh, right with my 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 partner, my wife, my wife and I. Actually, this is another book that we've done that is, uh, oh, cool. east coast, uh, you know, the sharks that come out to uh, out east coast uh, every summer. So we we've we've collaborated on several books together. Uh, right. And I, I'm somebody who's used to writing by himself, and it's been actually a lot of fun working yeah. with my wife. I'm just curious, what is it like to uh, to collaborate together and work together? I think we, well, we both work our, like Adam's um, art business at home anyway, and we've been doing that for a few years. And yeah, I think we, it is really easy for us. I know that sounds kind of lame or <laughs> it's not really funny, but yeah, we, like we have a good working relationship. We kind of each know our lane and we know what we are best at. And yeah. we're so opposite in those ways, I think, that are, that it works in our favor because Adam is the big, the big idea, the big dreamer and comes up with it. And then I kind of pull parts in and, and streamline it a bit. And yeah, and it works well that way. And like you said, he does, you know, the art and, and that obviously was an inspiration for the whole book, but, um, and I write and we're really, really lucky. Yeah. It works really well. Yeah. It works good on that level of like, obviously always being together. So whenever an idea pops up in your head, you can kind of talk about it right then and there rather than like jotting it down and trying to remember all the the different kind of concepts you have going through your head all the time. But uh, yeah, it was a, it was actually a really great project and we're looking forward to the, to doing another one here very soon. All right. I need to confirm this. Is the book out yet? Yes. Yeah. Ah, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I sometimes get copies of them. I don't always like, I know this are like their new book so i just want to make sure it's out and you can find it at elemento <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll look down below in beautiful typing um do we get do do we get like a little reading is that is that possible to, oh, yeah. for us to hear the book hold up the picture yeah. i really would love them uh it's possible to see like how beautiful the book looks um it's yeah. uh, it's really vividly illustrated yeah. a lot of I, i'll get her to read and then I can just, uh, yeah, I'll hold up pages and flip through. See husband and wife team working together, collaboration. Yeah. <laughs> so it starts, one sunny day, a young little shed Sorry. who once was white had now turned red. You can see the paint is. The other sheds thought that this was wrong. They all looked the same and she didn't belong. So Little Red cried now that no one would play. Feeling sad and alone, she wandered away. She felt certain that she was the same as before, but her friends didn't treat her that way anymore. This change is a curse anyone can see. No one I know will recognize me. Maybe the trick is not to be seen, so she hopped in a boat called the Ocean Queen. Little Red pushed out into the great unknown. A little nervous at first and missing her home. Then up from the ocean came a humpback whale, welcoming Little Red with a splash from his tail. Is that good? Do we want more? <laughs> uh, listen, I would be happy to hear the whole thing, but I'm also happy. No, to, okay, uh, yeah, yeah but, but I'm also happy to chat with you. We have a little bit of time, so if you want to, if you're happy to keep going, I'm sure our yeah, readers yeah. will go on for it. Lovely job. What a wonderfully beautiful, colorful shed! It's a pleasure to meet you, little red. 
Do you really think I'm beautiful? My friends think I'm strange. Well, nothing would be beautiful if we all look the same. So full of hope and no longer alone, Little Red Shed decided to head home. With the help of her friend, Little Red spun around and made the trek back to her seaside town. I love my new color, she said first in a whisper. I love my new color, now much louder and crisper. All the white sheds were shocked with delight to see Little Red so confident and bright. Then one by one, they all started to change. One green, one pink, one blue, one beige. What was, once with a, what was once a bundle without color or hue was now a rainbow, vibrant and true. Now all the oh. sheds appeared to the one they call red, hip hip hooray to the brave little shed. Oh, thank you. If you're at <laughs> home listening, that's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely. Um, you know, one of the uh, things I loved about the book was um, like the illustrations, a the use of color, the like the contrast of the red of the shed, but also like the ocean um, and the beautiful texture that you provide to waves and clouds. Often, when we're teaching, I mean, when I'm teaching my young students to to draw, it's it's about adding a lot of those details and experimenting with color and playing with color. Um, uh, how how much of what we see in the book comes from uh, where you live, uh, Fogo Island, for example? I mean, pretty much oh, all yeah. of it, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if we could take the, the camera out and just show you around, it's basically exactly what you see in the book. Um, I mean, we're, we live right alongside the ocean, so these little stages are all kind of peppered all throughout the island, all around. Um, and I mean, the weather changes on the, on the drop of a dime. So, I mean, those clouds roll in and the ocean gets angry. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty much entirely inspired by our, our surroundings for sure. So you guys get like uh, primo whale watching opportunities then where you are? Oh, we, yes. Yeah. We open those doors. We can watch it right from the, <laughs> from the living room. <laughs> it's not that we have very good raccoon watching. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, which I'm sure you could make a lovely book of. Many people have, but it was yeah. really. Uh, yeah, uh, I think what's different about our book was that Adam's, you know, I don't know if every book works that way where the artwork almost sometimes started parts, you know what I mean? And then we'd flow from there with words. You know, a lot of times someone writes a book and find the illustrator and, but he had all these and he, he hand painted every page and he, you know, so it was really such an inspiration in that way, trying to create that landscape and visually that kids would be drawn to it. So the illustrations were huge, yeah. Yeah, I mean, actually what's neat is today we've had two kind of author illustrators where that, that collaboration was part of the book from from the get-go as, yeah. as opposed to what is traditionally what happens is text and illustration. Like I rarely get to meet my illustrators except at functions like these. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I thought one of the other things I like about it is, you know, any story where you take like um, an animal or in this case, an object like a shed and you have to anthropomorphize it. Um, you know, <laughs> did I say that right? That was, yeah. that was great. <laughs> but, but you do a, actually a very interesting job without making it like a cartoon character, but giving the shed um in terms of the use of line and tension to give it like feeling and to give it emotion without, you know, disnifying it, I guess, in some ways, like, like cars or, yeah. um, yeah. how hard or easy is that for you to do? And how long does that take? Um, well, it comes pretty easy now because I've been doing it for so long. Um, I mean, my body of work is pretty much inspired. Well, mainly from the fishing stages and little houses and things like that. So earlier on, when I started my, like, I guess my artistic professional career, um, I started to just play around with just the subtleties of, of uh, a subtle angle um, and how that is enough. So it's, it's not a, like for me, and what you said is exactly true, where um, you can go overboard with it and it does become very, like, disney like, you um, but I wanted to create a very subtle um, 
a very subtle kind of uh, way of of making it seem as if it's 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 a shed, yes, but also the the lines make it so that you could see that sh like the shed is a, like a little bit happy or a little bit sad, and it it plays with that just a little bit, not but not going overboard. Yeah, it's it's I, I feel like it must be really tricky because you know we want to like gesticulate with our hands and make expressions with our faces, and so yeah. you're limited because you're not doing that. You've got the stilts for the shed and and yeah. just the the line and curve. I thought it was always that was a neat. Uh, a neat approach to doing that. Um, I also am just curious how how this story came about. Like, what was the genesis of this book for the two of you? I think just being teachers, being former teachers, and and having met so many students. Um, you know, your own experiences growing up, what your kids have gone through. You know, I think it's just a combination of a lot of things, mm -hmm. and wanting to create a book that, I mean, you can see from just hearing it that with the rhyme, even a really, really, you know, I have a niece who's five months old and, and they read it to her and the rhyme catches her and the pictures catches her. So kind of an introductory book in a way that just celebrates yourself and also encouraging kids to celebrate others, you know, and, and respect individuality and all that. So maybe like having a, you know, the idea was just having something early, like an early instilled early read pretty early, but can, can be appealing to an older audience as well you know just trying to, to really reach a, a large group yeah and we also wanted to uh, like like jen said like as teachers you see those kids in class and they have such huge personalities in those early years um i mean kids just are so accepting of each other in those in those grade one grade two grade three but as they get older mm -hmm. they start to kind of hold their real personalities back a bit because they're afraid of being made fun of or they're afraid of looking forward. So yeah, yeah. So, important. so it's, it's kind of a the book is, is supposed to be kind of a celebration of those like weird and wacky things that everyone kind of holds in their own personality and letting that being okay with it. And then yeah. how that becomes contagious once like, you know, you've been around someone who's kind of out there and they're, they're really kind of like comfortable with themselves and it makes you comfortable with yourself being around them. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where, you know, as as teachers, as you know, some of us in the virtual room are like, you know, the the power of of a book and the power of image and text and and what we choose to model to young people and to make them realize like it's okay to be me and whatever, you know, what whoever I am and yeah. to help them you know, discover like who who are we, and that's kind of the, the power of teaching. I've always felt is is making those connections and having books like these and like a lot of the ones that we've had here today to to be able to serve as 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 a model, right? Um, you know, actually, my my question is like it's a, it's an interesting time. You know, I I we are now doing this virtually. Virtually, it, it would be unlikely that we'd be able to have you. you know, Hopefully we'd be would have been able to have you in person for a word on the street, but but we are certainly with a great deal of ease able to reach out to you all the way in Newfoundland today. Um, are you able to? Are there any plans to be able to do any kind of virtual touring or virtual activities with with schools and to be able to connect with readers uh, with with this book? Well, we'd love to. I mean, we've been re we've been uh, contacted by a lot of individual teachers, you know what I mean, starting back up their year and using the book as an introductory, you know, to classroom and how classroom environment, how we treat and um, activities stemming from it. So mostly it's been that sort of one on one reach out. It hasn't been, you know, on a larger scale than that. But it's really nice because the kids, you know, we FaceTime classrooms and stuff and kids will ask you questions and um, and then they want to ask about Adam's art and, you know, so, and the teacher can use it to go over the, you know, a broader curriculum, you know, you could do an art lesson and different things. So, yeah, I mean, we're open to all that because we really feel strongly about the message and, mm -hmm. yeah. And like, obviously the, this whole pandemic has created some strange situations. I mean, this is the first time we've ever released a book, so we have no basis of comparison as yeah. to like what a regular book launch would be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah we literally released it in may so yeah we've yeah it's been weird it was perfect timing um so anyway but i i mean yeah i mean we it this these kinds of situations like 
like you said, like we would have probably never had the opportunity to speak to everyone or be part of that festival if if this wouldn't happen. So I guess there's some silver lining in all of this as well for for people like us, especially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and I hope that, you know, being part of our, our Toronto Word on the Street will, will open that book up to a whole bunch of new readers, but yeah. also some teachers who might be uh, – looking for some author visits. Uh, Adam and Jennifer you are both available to FaceTime with your classroom, yes? Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. reach out to us for sure and we'll chat. Yeah, so uh, that sounds great. Um, I guess I guess, question I have is what, what are you guys working on now? Anything new on the horizon for you? Um, Adam's artwork keeps us extremely busy. Yeah. Um, that's a big thing for us, but we have started our, our second one, our second book, just with ideas and um, you know, basic sketches and things like that. So that's mm-hmm. our big focus this fall, I think, uh, to get that kind of streamlined a bit. Yeah. How long, how long does it take you guys to put together a picture book like this, like in terms of from idea to, you know, finished product? What, what how long does it take? Because we weren't consistently working on the first one because we had the idea, you'd make ideas, then you'd put it aside and you kind of, yeah. it was like a pipe dream kind of thing. You weren't really driven towards Right. This one would like, you know, know the process a bit better. Yeah. I don't know. I'd like you'd like to think by Christmas you'd have some things yeah. really, you know, feeling yeah. pretty good about it. Yeah. And this one here, I mean, we we wrote it a hundred times because yeah. we wanted it to be as simple as possible. We kept yeah. kind of it like I mean, we would every page had like ten lines on it and we tried to boil that down to one or two. So that's hard in itself to do where you're trying to get the as much meaning out of the out of the message as possible with the least amount of text. Mm-hmm. Yes, to any young people watching now, going, I would like to be an author one day, yeah. and, and I'm glad that multiple uh, of today's guests are, you know, discussing the importance of editing our work and to, yes. and you know, especially the picture book that that balance between text and image is really really important. Yeah, um, yeah to make to make both shine really. Um, I see that we are very shortly to run out of time. I would like to thank the pair of you uh, for being here. I'm sorry that Johnny Cash was unable to make it. <laughs> Let me go get him. Just a Ronnie, he's unapproach He's oh. seven years old. He's blind. He's not doing so hot lately, but he's still on the go. All right. He's coming. Yeah. Who doesn't want? Oh, my goodness. There he oh, is. Oh, he's so cute. <laughs> look, he's got. Johnny. Oh, look, Cash. Who's that, Cash? He's in a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's why we have this event to bring pets from across the country together. Together, yes, yeah. it's a goal. <laughs> well, because your hosting duties are done, you're free. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks so much for uh, for being a part of this. Uh, it was great to have you guys share your story and your experiences. Um, I, I really appreciate it. I know that our viewers really appreciate it. And uh, good luck with uh, trying to promote this book in the midst of a pandemic. And, <laughs> your next one. and teachers who are looking for guests, they yeah. are available. Come to your We're here. <laughs> here. Ask for your in classroom. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. All right. Hey, Paula. Hey, um, it's by the way, it's a pleasure to meet you, Adam and Jennifer. That reading was absolutely wonderful, yeah. and my heart feels very full now. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, amazing hosting duties, Jeff. By the way, yeah, amazing. Good. So, thank Penelope. Oh, yes, <laughs> Penelope, of course, and your mm-hmm. lovely signs. I love all of it. It has <laughs> been an incredible morning with all of you. But yeah, thank you so much for being here. Awesome. It was, right. it was an honor and a pleasure. Thanks. For Thanks sure. So Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, Jeff. And thanks to Jennifer, Adam, Jennifer, Adam, Hassan, Bob, and Elizabeth for your readings this morning. We're just about to head into our first break. We will be back at noon with a presentation by the Ontario Science Center followed by readings for middle grade and teen readers by Drew Shannon, Nathan Page, Alicia Seveny, and Kenneth Opal, and our special presentation with First Nations Community Reads. For more great programming for early readers, 
please visit our friends at the Telling Tales Festival at tellingtales.org. Once again, our kids and teens programming returns at noon. See you again soon.
Welcome back to the Kids and Teen Stream. Our next presentation is from the Ontario Science Center. Caitlin Ryan is here to tell us about stories in the sky. Discover a storybook in the sky with the Ontario Science Center. Learn about constellations and their, and their importance to astronomy, history, and culture during this live event. Then connect the stars in new ways during a fun hands-on activity. Hi, Caitlin. I'm just about to remove this. Okay, wow, that was really something to see and very soothing after this crazy morning. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna let you uh, go right into it. So let me just disappear. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, wasn't that a really lovely video that we just saw? Um, that was something that was done for the Ontario Science Centre by a group of artists called System Sounds. Um, so what we saw was a creative musical interpretation of what we can see in the night sky. Um, when we look up at the stars, it's really easy to let our imaginations run wild. And I think this is why I'm personally so excited for today's event. Um, the stars and the constellations that we see in the night sky are a great reminder of human imagination and how we pass on our own stories. Um, so before we get into it, I would just like to say that um, I'm calling in from here in Toronto, I'm actually quite close to the Science Centre, um, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, uh, and the Wendat peoples, and is now still home to many diverse First Nations and Métis peoples. Um, so we will always want to acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And th that is important to me too, just to be able to, to recognize that this is land that uh, is still in use by many peoples, um, and that there are lots of stories and history and culture and things that we can learn from them. Um, so we, I've already used this word constellations, and we're going to be talking a lot about constellations today. So I think it's important that the very first thing that we do is talk about what is a constellation. Now, this word comes from ancient Latin. Um, it's a language that was spoken about 2,000 years ago um, and is still not really used today. Some people read it, but not really anyone speaks it. So that word constellation comes from two words in Latin, con, which means together, and stella, which means stars. So if we put it together, we have constellation or stars together. So that means that a constellation is like a group of stars. It's a, a, they make patterns or shapes that we can see in the night sky. It's kind of like playing connect the dots. Um, just because we're talking a little bit about Latin, a lot of English words come from Latin, um, but lots of other languages like French and Spanish and Portuguese, those all come from Latin as well. So as long as people have been around, they've been looking up at the night sky and use their imagination to find these constellations or pictures in the stars. And then they use these pictures to tell stories about what they saw. 
And this is one major way that people have passed on their culture and heritage through generations because the stars are always there. Now, I said the stars are always there. That's not 100% true, is it? Because sometimes, you know, we don't see the stars during the daytime like now. And the stars that we do see do tend to change. See, the Earth, I'm going to pull up this little model here. This is my, my sun. And I've got a little Earth. Here we go. So the Earth is constantly traveling around the sun. And you might have already known this, but bear with me for a second. So every year, planet Earth makes one trip all the way around the sun, right? Now, if we imagine that our sun and our whole solar system is in one big universe with full of stars, that means that when Earth is over here, it's seeing stars in the galaxy over here. And let's say that this is winter time, but if it's over here and it's halfway through the year, so it's summertime now, then we're seeing stars in the galaxy over on this side. So that's why sometimes you might see different stars or different constellations during the summer time versus during the winter time. So there's always, uh, always different constellations that are going through our sky and we're seeing them differently. Um, another thing that you might notice is that if you've ever traveled and you've gone down to the southern hemisphere, you would see different stars too, because up here in Canada, we see stars from the north. But if you were in Australia, you might see stars in the south. So that's a difference as well. But still, we're gonna talk a little bit about constellations that we're able to see in the north, but it does mean that you can't always see them. You have to watch out for them at cer during certain seasons. Um, I also mentioned that we're seeing stars in our galaxy. And galaxy, this is a funny word as well. See, we live in a very large galaxy. Our solar system is part of a galaxy called the Milky Way, and that is also a collection of stars. They call it the Milky Way because people thousands of years ago thought that the night sky looked like someone had spilt milk over a black cloth. And this kind of image stuck around. So that's actually where we get the word galaxy from. Um, gala means Greek, uh, sorry, gala means milk in Greek. So that's where we get our word galaxy. Okay, so that's just a little bit about our solar system and our galaxy where we can see the constellations. Now, we can see 88 officially recognized constellations uh, recognized by the International Astronomical Union. And many of these constellations have different names and stories from around the world. So mostly the official names are from um, ancient Greek stories, but there are lots of other ones too. And I'm just going to share my screen for a second so I can show you some examples of constellations that we can see. All right, hopefully you can see what we're looking at here. I'm gonna bring this up. So what we're looking at here is the constellation called Cassiopeia. Now it's kind of this W shape, right? Well, in ancient Greek, it's called Cassiopeia, but to, uh, and to ancient Chinese peoples, this was called Wang Liang, um, and it was supposed to represent a charioteer, which is kind of cool, a little bit different. And I'll get into what Cassiopeia is in a second, but very, a very different interpretation than what the ancient Greeks thought. So that's two different stories and two different names from two different cultures because people have been looking at the stars for thousands of years all around the world. And one way that we can know this is yes, through different stories, but also through the names of the constellation or the names of the stars and the names of the constellations too. So each star has its own name, and not all of them are official names. There are some that are official, again, recognized by the International Astronomical Union, um, ones like Rukba and Shadar and Kaf. Those are all official names. Now, these are not Greek, though. These are names in Arabic, and they're names that mean Shadar is chest, Kaf means hand, and Rukba means knee. So that means that what we're looking at here is something that ancient Arabic peoples thought was someone's body. Pretty different from a chariot. Now, the other names that we see, Segan and Navi, these are not official names, these are nicknames. And Navi has kind of a funny story behind it. Um, this nickname comes from an astronaut. His name was Gus Ivan Grissom. Now his middle name, Ivan. If you take that backwards, 
that's Navi. So he gave it this nickname that stuck around. So that is one thing about these constellations and stars that we can see is everyone has their own take on them. And you can get creative with them yourselves, making your own constellations, giving them your own names and telling different stories with that. Um, so we've seen, okay, so we've seen that it's uh, a Greek constellation. We've seen- Sorry, Arabic. I just wanted to say one thing, Caitlin. Uh, I can't actually see the oh. screen share. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I will try again. There's a share screen um, is button at the bottom. Oh, okay. Is that it? Beautiful. I see okay. it. Yay. Sorry okay, about I'm that. Here again. Oh, no worries at all. Okay. I'll, I'll back up for a second then. Um, just want to point out again, if you can see, I'm circling Rukba here. That was the one that means knee. Shadar is chest and calf means hand. Can you see all of that? Okay, hopefully you can. Um, so that way you can see that the different stars have different names that come from different cultures. So um, like I was saying, we have uh, these Arabic names for the stars for a Greek constellation that has a different name in ancient China. So there's a lot of different cultures at play here. Um, and they all have their own stories. So you can make up your own stories as well to go with these. And there actually is a really great story about Cassiopeia. That's actually why I chose this constellation as an example for us. So the story goes, um, and this is a, it's a very old story. It's over 2000 years old. Um, the story goes that Cassiopeia was a queen in ancient Ethiopia. And she was very, very beautiful. Everyone told her so all the time. They would say, oh, you are just absolutely gorgeous. How did you get your hair like that? Things like that. And so Cassiopeia really took this to heart. It went up, to, it went to her head and she started going around saying, I'm the most beautiful woman in the whole world. I'm more beautiful than all the sea nymphs. Now, naturally, they were not happy about that. And the god of the sea, Poseidon, wasn't happy either. So he sent a monster called Cetus to come and attack the coast of Ethiopia as a punishment for the queen. And hopefully you can see that Cetus constellation here too. That's also represented in the night sky. Now, obviously this was a huge problem for Queen Cassiopeia. And she racked her brain trying to think of what she could do about this whole Cetus sea monster problem. Um, but she could not come up with any solutions. So she asked her husband, the King Cepheus, if he had any suggestions. And Cepheus is usually seen right beside her in the night sky and as this constellation. So he didn't have any real suggestions either, but what he did say was that they should go consult an oracle or ask a fortune teller for advice. And this oracle told them that the only way that they could get rid of the sea monster was to sacrifice their daughter, the princess Andromeda, to the monster. So they left her, tied her up on a rock for the monster to eat. And she is usually seen below them in the sky. There's Princess Andromeda. Now, at this time, luckily for her, it was the age of the ancient Greek heroes. And there happened to be one roaming around the countryside, killing monsters and saving maidens. And this was right up his alley. And his name was Perseus. You can find him there beside Andromeda. So Perseus decided that once he heard about this, he decided that it was his duty to go and save the princess. He was a hero after all. So he rushed to her side as quickly as he could. And the way he was able to make it was because he rode there on the, on the back of a winged horse named Pegasus, who you can also see with all of these other constellations in the night sky. So there is Pegasus. And so to remember this, the great deeds of Perseus the hero and all of that bravery, this whole story was put up in the, in the night sky as constellations. So they are remembered there for all eternity to come, which is pretty cool for us because we get to hear these stories even though it's so, so much later now. So if you were to look for these constellations, you can find them in the night sky if you know where to look for the Big Dipper. So it looks kind of like a spoon. And if you were to draw a line from the ends of the Big Dipper way across the sky, you would hit a W shape. 
and that's Cassiopeia. Or you might find four stars that are really bright and look kind of like a square. And those are these four squares that are part of per uh, Pegasus here. And they call that the autumn square because it's really bright and easy to spot in autumn. And we're officially in autumn now for about a week. Now, this autumn square, it's not really a constellation on its own because it's just a part of the constellation Pegasus. But according to an introduction to Ojibwe star knowledge, which is a book by um, Annette Lee, William Wilson, and Jeff Jeffrey Tibbetts, and Carl Galboy, um, this same group of stars is called moose, which sounds a lot like moose. And it is supposed to represent the moose um, in Ojibwe culture. Um, so the moose was, uh, was put up in the stars um, and was honored for giving its life because it was a traditional source of food, clothing, and shelter. So again, that's another example of how we can have two constellations or two stories for one constellation because we're able to see how it affected different cultures differently and how they remember it differently, which is kind of neat. So now that we've learned a little bit about constellations, we can make models uh, of these same constellations so that we can they can help us look for them in the night sky. So you can do this for any constellation that you like, but today I'm going to make Cassiopeia because it's the one that we've been talking about the most today. So you will need, um, you'll need a pen or, or something to write with. You'll need paper. You will need scissors. You might need some string or something to tie with. You will need Play-Doh or plasticine. You could even use marshmallows if you want, although then you have to make sure that you don't eat them and that's that's a struggle for me. So I'm gonna be using Play-Doh today. Um, and you will need toothpicks. Okay. Oh, and a hanger. If you wanna get really fancy, you can use a hanger. So what we'll be doing first is we're going to draw our constellation on a piece of paper. So because I'm doing Andromeda or I'm doing Cassiopeia today, I'm going to draw a W and I'm going to add some really big um, dots where the stars would be. So it's going to look something like this. Okay. So hopefully you can see those dots there. So those dots represent the stars. So for each dot, the next step is to take our Play-Doh or plasticine and just take a little tiny piece and roll it into a little ball just like that. And then you can do one of those each for each of your stars and place them on the dots of your constellation. So you can kind of map out your stars. And so each little ball of Play-Doh will represent your star. So once you finish that, then it's when the toothpicks come in handy because you're going to use the toothpicks to connect the constellation. So grab a toothpick. And just put the little stars, Play-Doh stars onto them and connect them as you need to. Now, sometimes these are going to be too long so if you need to, you can always just snap the toothpick, break it as you need to, to make it shorter or longer. But in the end, you'll have, you'll have a bunch of sticks like this at the beginning, but eventually, and I did, a, I did a bunch of this beforehand, so I would be ready. Don't worry if it doesn't take you as short as it takes me, but eventually you'll have something that looks kind of like this. And this is our basic constellation. So it's kind of nice that you can see it all mapped out here just like this. So you'll be able to take this outside with you if you want to look for um, the constellations in the night sky. And you can look and try to match it up, see where you can find it in the sky. Um, but if you want to try to make a model of the sky, you can get go on to the next steps. So after that, you can cut pieces of string. And I would suggest using quite a few, um, maybe enough for all the toothpicks or at least most of the toothpicks. And you wanna just tie, tie your string around your toothpicks. Again, I've done some of this in advance already, but you'll end up with, mine's coming apart here because I've got the strings tangled. There we go. 
you'll end up with something that looks kind of like this. Oh, it's fallen off, but that's okay. Something looks kind of like this. Then with the other ends, so you've tied one end of the string to your toothpicks, but with the other end of the string, you can tie it to a coat hanger. Now, if you do this, you'll be able to have, um, have something that you can hang up and maybe you can do a bunch of them and create the whole story. So for example, I did this one earlier. Again, it's kind of falling apart now, but I did another constellation earlier this week that I'm able to hang up and kind of make a little model in my own home of the night sky, which is kind of cool. And you can use those even kind of like puppets if you wanted for telling the stories too. Pretty neat. Um, if you leave your, if you're using plasticine or Play-Doh, if you leave it out long enough as well, it'll air dry and that way it'll hold everything together really well. So in the end, you'll have a lot of beautiful pictures and you can use them kind of as a storybook. So there you go. There you have it. You have models of your own constellations. Now, as I said, I was just doing ones that we have used in our story today, but that doesn't mean it has to end there. It's up to you to decide which constellations you want to draw or model, but you could even do your own, right? You, I'm sure lots of you like to draw pictures. You can draw your own pictures and come with your, up with your own stories. Like for example, I said before I really like marshmallows, maybe I would do one about s'mores and then uh, a picture of a s'more and then tell a story about going camping or something like that. So if you're doing that, you can get really, really creative with it. And you can even try to find those shapes when you go out and look at the night sky. So you might wanna think of a name for your constellation or names for your stars as well, and stories to go along with it. You might wanna think about different languages. What, like, what language will the name be in or what language will the name of the stars be in? And maybe you think about, will this be a story that represents you and your per personal or family history? Or is it going to be something you make up? Um, are you going to name it after yourself like that astronaut, Gus Ivan Grissom? Um, and how will that name relate to your story? So we had those names before, Rukba and Shadar and Kath that are all different body parts because Cassiopeia, our constellation that we looked at, is supposed to represent the body of a queen. She, it's hard to see it because it looks like a W, but she was supposed to look like a queen. And if you place the names properly, you can kind of see how the end one is Kath's hand, right? Kind of makes sense. So you can think about how you name things and how that all, all represents one story altogether. And if you're doing this, that's really great because you'll be doing the exact same thing that our ancestors have done for thousands of years. Um, if you're looking for some inspiration for this, you can always pull up a star chart as well, and maybe those can help you too if you're looking for, um, for inspiration for drawing out your models. And there are some really great ones that you can find online, including one from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. So that's one thing that I would recommend is if you're not going to make up your own story, you might want to try using one of those star charts to help you model it. There are lots of other really great resources online too that you can use. Um, things like Native Sky Watchers is a great website, or there's um, uh, planetarium software that you can download. It's called Stellarium. And actually that Stellarium, Stella, right? We learned about that, stars at the very beginning. Um, or something else you can do is join us at the Ontario Science Centre for a virtual star party. So if you go to our YouTube page, you'll be able to find one that we did over the summer. Um, but if you watch out on our website as well, you'll be, you might find that you'll be able to join us for one upcoming in the fall. So stick around and see if you can find a, find a star party to join us for. Um, finally, I'd just like to encourage you to really spend some time outside on a clear night. See what you can see and let your imagination soar because you just might notice something new that sparks your imagination. So thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you learned a little bit of something about words and storytelling and stars and our shared human history. Um, thank you so much and have a great day, a great rest of the Word on the Street Festival. Wow, thank you, Caitlin. That was really incredible to see and all the stories that you told. And I actually just wanted to show you something very sure. cool. If I uh, turn, <laughs> if you look at my bedroom That's wall. awesome. <laughs> I have I my love little, that. yeah, then there's little stars that you can see like around planet Earth and all that. So yeah, I just wanted to share that oh, cool little thing about my room. Yeah, no problem. But yeah, no, this has been really great. Thank you so much, Caitlin. 
Thank you too. Yeah. All right. Have a good day. You as well. So uh, we still have a couple minutes until our next programming. Um, so for now, I'm just going to put on a, a reel of our lovely sponsors and we will be back at 1230 uh, for me to introduce our next host, Carrie Lynn Winters.
Hello and welcome back. Um, so your next host for the uh, for the hour is going to be Dr. Carrie Lynn Winters. And let me just grab her. Oh, sorry about that. Hi, Carrie Lynn. All Hi. right, so let me get right into intro an introduction. So Carrie Lynn Winters is a children's author, playwright, performer, and scholar. Since 20, sorry, 2007, she has authored over 27 books. Carrie Lynn holds an associate professor position in Brock University's facu Faculty of Education. Her research interests include arts, education, children's literature, and embodied literacy. She lives in St. Catharines, Ontario with her two kids and three cats. <laughs> Hi. Amazing. Hi, Carrie Lynn. It's a pleasure to have you here, and I'm not going to stay on screen any longer. Just going to leave the floor to you. Thanks so much. It's a joy to be no here today. At all. I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> Word on the street. Yay. I hope everybody's having a great time today. Um, I'm broadcasting in from St. Catharines, which is the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples and many of whom continue to live and work here today. And this territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Agreement. So um, today these lands are the home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples and acknowledging them reminds us of our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendship of Indigenous people. It's my pleasure today to be a host, and we have um, two people here today. We have Drew Shannon, who is an illustrator based in Toronto. Uh, he has illustrated other books too, called Out of the Ice, Extreme Battlefields, This Is Your Brain on Stereotypes, I love that. <laughs> and, and more recently, just out with Kids Can Press, the Montague Twins, um, The Witch's Hand, which we'll be talking about in just a minute. Before we do that, I want to also introduce uh, Nathan Page. He was born in Kingston, hi, uh, where he began writing and performing at an early age. And this is going to be The Montague Twins, The Witch's Hand is his first graphic novel. He lives in Toronto with his cat, Marlo. <laughs> yep, so he's, he's around here. Hi. <laughs> thanks, thanks so much. It's uh, great, great to great to be here. Thanks for it on the street, and thank you, Gary. Gary yeah. Martin. So we're gonna have a lot of fun today, and I'm gonna ask you to share your screens in just a minute. But yep. um, so I was really excited when I got your book because it is a graphic novel. <laughs> and um, I didn't realize that until I opened it, and I was like, "Oh, great!" So, um, <laughs> what a fun I surprise! <laughs> I hope <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I also realized that you two both are roommates. Is that correct? That's right. He's right above me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Down there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you must work very closely together. So tell us a little bit about how you work together before we read a little section of your um, graphic novel. Okay. Um, well, gee, there's a lot of, uh, what, well, how would you describe it, Nathan? <laughs> um, I, I would say uh, nonstop loving back and forth. Like it's a lot, yes. it's a lot of dialogue. It's a lot of conversation um, mm -hmm. while being careful not to step on one another's toes. Like obviously, um, Drew entrusts the writing aspect to me, and he'll offer suggestions every every now and again. And then with the art, like I'm like, you do your thing, Drew. I <laughs> cannot do that. So, but he'll sometimes ask my opinion on certain panels and stuff. So it's um, it, always always compromising. And uh, <laughs> I love okay. how it's such an interactive process. Even that you two are roommates and. You can just bounce ideas off each other and probably go, oh, how's it feel if I change this in the in the plot? Oh, that that's great, but I'm not getting this in the pictures. Yeah, yeah totally. There's a lot of that kind of shared brainstorming aspect. And then there's the, the moment where we get to lean on each other too when we do feel like we need that extra, like, I, I have this idea, you know, like we get to be like, this is, I think what Nathan said, we trust each other's strengths a lot. And then we also like, 
when we have questions about, you know, things that like we're working on or something, it's just so nice to, to, uh, to be able to have that person like so accessible to just be like, Hey, let me run this by you real quick. And it's like, that's a great idea. Or like, Oh yeah, I don't know. It's exactly like you said, Carolyn. Exactly. But uh, yeah, Thanks. we love that. Yeah. I write picture books and sometimes I get that opportunity too to work with the illustrators. So that's really great. All right. Without further ado, let's share a little bit of your work. Okay. Hold on a sec. Let me figure out the screen sharing thing. Uh, let's see. Okay. I want this screen. And and I'm gonna grab this. Can everybody see everything that's happening? And now there we, we go. Can. We can now you it. can. Great. Okay. Super. Is there any is there any way to go to the full show? Because I think we see your actual screen where it has like the oh, top and everything yeah. at the top. Oh yeah, that's so weird. Okay. Yes, there is. Now Boom. we're talking. Oh, now wow. we're talking. I, I just saw, clicked a button that had a picture. I was like, oh, this works. Just to the right as well. We'll get. I think we can see you as well. If we, if you try you to, can, you can see me still. No, 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 not anymore. I thought I could if you moved it, but that's okay. Great. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Well, let's start. I guess. Uh, should we actually like describe what the book is about first? Maybe. Maybe give us a little context. In <laughs> yeah, the like <laughs> it's like you guys even know what you're watching. Uh, <laughs> So Nathan, I'll leave that to you. <laughs> okay. Um, so the Montague twins, uh, twin brothers, detectives uh, who solve supernatural mysteries in the late 1960s. And right now we are witnessing their, their, the beginning of their newest mystery uh, really kicking off. So Yeah. So yeah. we're in... Uh... Ready in media res, as they say. Okay. Uh, so I'll be playing the part of Pete and Nathan will be playing the part of Al. So I'll be getting. Okay, Al, you've had your fun. Have you ever seen anything like it? No, and I've seen just enough of it. Let's go. Pete, just look at it. Do you feel that energy and that smell like, like lavender and mint? Tell me you don't smell that too. Are you high? Did Tennyson give you something at the record store? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, okay, yes. I feel it too. Are you happy? So what do you want to do? We're, We're going, going in, in that, that lighthouse. lighthouse. Hey, Al. Whoa. What? Nothing. Onward and upward? Extreme emphasis on upwards. So, oh, that's so do you have a plan? Uh, yeah, check out what's up there and then get the hell out of the rotting building. No, no, I mean a plan for telling Shelly and David that uh, that their adopted son is making out with their daughter. What? We only, I mean, we just, we haven't, she's oh, just. I, I know very well you've nothing but the purest intentions, brother. <laughs> Shelly, on the other hand, is going to string you up by your Ah! Al! Fingers. Ah, she's going to string you up by your fingers. I can't reach you. Hang on, I'll be right down. Forget it. Head upstairs and see what that psycho is up to. What are you going to do? Just hang out there and miss all the action? You know me better than that. <laughs> Running. Whoa, crazy. What's happening? Oh, no. Anyways, later. <laughs> <laughs> so that kicks off the mystery, and um, they are trying to find out what's going on with this uh, spooky, mysterious box that they found at, at the top of the lighthouse. And so here we are. They've found that there might be an identical one in the newly reopened uh, Port Howell Museum. Oh. 
He's gone. Let's go. Don't you think we should wait for him to come around a couple of times? Get his timing down? He's going back to his desk, putting up his feet and reading a girly mag. It bothers me you're so certain. He wasn't turning back because he was suspicious. He was turning back because he felt guilty. He wanted to make sure he was really alone. What's our goal here? Our goal? Yeah, like, are we stealing this? Are we guarding it? Tell me we aren't stealing it. Shoot. I don't think we're stealing it. Okay, hang on. All I'm saying is that if it's between us stealing it and her getting it, I'm going with us stealing it, you know? We don't steal things, Al. We solve mysteries. We don't make them. So imagine how easy this one will be to solve. The mystery of who took the stupid box. Oh, I know. We did. Al, stop. Just shut up. Look, we're guarding it up until the point when we have to steal it. If you have a better idea, let's hear it. Al, you need to turn around. Pete, you know I've turned it around. Did I have a shoplifting phase after mom and dad? Sure. But I put that behind me. These are extenuating circumstances. I am definitely not going to really love doing it. It's kind of awesome, right? Ding, ding, ding. We've got ourselves a case of good news, bad news. We technically aren't going to be stealing the hand. And the bad news? Well, the bad news is, I think we have to catch it. Oof. Skitter, 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 skitter. Good idea. You do the running this time. Get the box and come on. <sighs> sure, Pete. I'll just stick my hands through a trillion tiny pieces of glass and get the box. Sure thing, Pete. No problem. Please don't cut me. Please don't cut me. Please don't cut me. Oh, that feels weird. <sighs> I swear I'm not really enjoying this. That's that. And <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. <laughs> oh wow, <laughs> that was a fantastic performance! I didn't expect <laughs> the sound effects and all the music. Hey, oh I come God. prepared here. She's been rehearsing the sound for days. Yeah, just awesome. for, yeah. It's so fun to see it perform like that. Oh man, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna share it with everyone I know. I think that's an amazing way to present. A graphic please, novel. Please do. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Um, the suspense and the, and then the close-ups and then you saw like everything happening. Even the scrolling up the staircase was really awesome. I love Thank that. Thank you. Thank you so much. So for people who want to get your books, uh, mm -hmm. your book, they can shop on today's book list with Elemento uh, Bookstore, Elemento.ca, or find the link in the live YouTube comment scroll. So um, they can do that. Yep, it's right Great. at the bottom of the screen so they can see that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the Montague twins. Um, so tell me, it has, it has a feeling for me, uh, a rem it reminds me of the Hardy Boys. So, and um, I know you've heard that before. So did those books inspire you or have you uh, read those books or? <laughs> it's 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 funny that you talk about that because i i know the hardy boys i feel like they're just like culturally known um but i have never read a hardy boys book back to back like cover to cover <laughs> i will admit embarrassingly enough i read uh when i was a kid there was other mystery books like um there were these these mystery solving kids called what were they called? The like mystery solving kids or something. It was like really like a generic silly name like that, but they had some cool stories. Um, really? And then there was like, what was that other one? Uh, not Nancy Drew. There's Encyclopedia also, like, Brown. Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Brown. Encyclopedia Brown. Yeah, yes, I that, that was one. Yeah, that's one I read. So there was sort of that like that whole genre of like kids solving mysteries. Like there's something about that that I, I love 
culturally, I guess. And so I wanted to do something similar, but like with like a little bit of our own flavor to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What about but you, Nathan? I, um, I dabbled in Hardy Boys, but never like really, really dove in. Um, but that being said, like to Drew's point, it's it's just been it's had such a large influence on on culture, culture and media. So I think we're inspired by the things that we're inspired by the Hardy Boys. So whether that be you know, like a Lost Boys or even even Stranger Things to a degree. It's this mm -hmm. this, this mystery element um, of in teenagers having to really do the work of adults. <laughs> <laughs> um, that that that's probably largely where the influence comes in. But mm -hmm. uh, aesthetically, like definitely, um, I, I don't want to speak to that too much, but going for that vibe a little bit as well. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. I was doing yeah. I was doing that. Well, I think that you did a great job of kind of like bringing it to the focus today in today's world too. So um, I think that's fantastic. And sometimes we don't know what we're influenced by. And I also love the fact that you bring up doing the work of adults because um, when you when you read a mystery, you have to in infer a lot. You have to think about the clues that are before you and you have to kind of like try to put the clues in sort of some sort of sequence or um, patterns so that you can kind of understand the broader story. So thinking of that genre, what are some ideas that you had to keep in mind when you wrote the story and also when you illustrated the story? Hmm. Good question. I um, love that question. Yeah, I think I just, I, I described it to Drew is I always have to leave the breadcrumbs or the thread for myself and knowing where that winds up and how where it starts and you can't lose sight of that along the way um you can take you can take diversions certainly um but it inevitably it has to serve the character and the story which in this case is a mystery so um <laughs> you definitely have to have your eyes on the final goal of the, the payoff in the end and how it all comes together yeah, it's hard. It's hard to write a mystery when you know all of the answers because you have to remember that your characters don't know certain things. And there was even parts in the book where, you know, our editor would be like, how do your characters know this? And we'd be like, oh, right. They don't. They don't know that yet. So we would have yeah. to, like, go back and look and be like, OK, where are the, the clues that they might have picked up on this? And then can we put those in or do they just not know? And so there's a lot of that that's just like uh, sprinkled kind of throughout is just like we have to remember those things or keep them in mind. Yeah, and then definitely certain elements because there's it's one thing in the writing, but uh, to go back to your question, in in the drawing, Drew mm. would have to be very cognizant of like, oh, I can't I can't show that yet, or yeah. like that's that's not quite right yet, and it was um, a continuity nightmare. But <laughs> <laughs> it kind of, it was sometimes, yeah. When you're when you're drawing panel after panel after panel, and it's like you you do a lot of cross referencing to previous things you've drawn because they now exist in canon right so you have to remember oh right well i can't do this because back here i already had this and so now i have to do it to, to match this you know and it's like that's really important when you're trying to keep things from your audience <laughs> yeah exactly well there's definitely a synergy you can feel that too so it's some sort of like you guys rely on each other not to tell the full story and also i think would think to also leave some red herrings so that you kind of also think other things. Kids can infer lots of things. Many are not correct. Many are correct. I mean, many are going to play out. Many don't, right? And that's all part of reading. And I think that's part of a nuanced kind of way of reading a mystery as well. So, yeah. yeah really good point. Love that. Lots of fun. So um, there's a narrative balance as well, I find, between the mystery and then going back to the moments of everyday life. So there's like these kind of like mysterious things happening, but then there's like day to day, just like boring kind of things happening as well. You know, not boring, but you know, day to day that we can. So like, how do you balance sort of like the realism and then the mystery as well and still make that make sense? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, that that was a lot of 
a lot of trial and error. <laughs> Thankfully, um, you know, we we got a lot of runway because we we started on this project um, years ago now. I mean, we were at Word on the Street in 2016, actually, and we uh, were talking about the first chapter, which we had released online. I think and we so, didn't even have a publisher yet, so it was just like we had just up to us, just. Um, uh, teamed up with our agent, actually. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like the the start of everything. Um, so yeah, it uh, we had a lot of a lot of runway, and we were able to hone in on what what we really thought was important, and just as important as the magic and the mystery for us was the characters, because we loved these characters before we even put pen to paper we had they were so so real to us and it was just immensely important that um we did them justice and showed their day-to-day -day lives and showed the challenges that they have because i i also think it's something that um i hope will resonate with teenagers is there's there's a lot of there's a lot of gold in the mundane i yeah. think I think it's really about balancing that mundane with the with the magic, like you're saying. It's like you can't have something be incredible and 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 magical without there being something mundane to compare it against, you know. So I feel like it was really important for us to make sure that that balance was there. And like to Nathan said, like the characters, we just we wanted to see what they would be like outside of just being completely amazed all the time, or like you know, in in this one particular moment because you know, people are, aren't like that. It's like these, there are events and then there are the day to day and just like, what is, what's it, what's it like to just be these folks to, to like walk around in this town. Like we were really interested in like building that world as well. Wow. Yeah. yeah I love that. Um, one of the theorists I really, really love is um, named Dorothy Heathcote and she's like amazing. Like, um, drama theorist for um, drama and education. And one thing she talks about it in terms of story is um, dropping to the universal. And if you can't like drop to the universal, like what is universal? What you were saying is sort of mundane so that people can connect, so they can kind of connect in and then they'll, they'll give you their suspension of disbelief. They'll believe mm -hmm. you so long as it's anchored in that sort of universal universal, sorry, or mundane. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate that idea of moving back and forth between those those two um, elements. So you set this in the late 1960s. Now, someone who was born in the late 1960s, <laughs> mind you, I was only born like two days. In, in the <laughs> but anyway, um, why did you choose that time period? Tell me a little bit more about your choices around, you know, that time period. Um, I mean, you know, it's interesting because we've we've done we've been lucky enough to do a, a couple of these virtual events now in promotion of the book, and the answers I've typically given have largely been like aesthetic and everything. But then the more I think about it, the more I'm starting to realize like it just it feels like such a, a, an era that haunts us still. And I mean, I don't mean haunt in a bad way necessarily, but so, so many things from the 60s the late 60s and all, all throughout history it can really really see them now in in everything that's that's happening and all of the turmoil um mm -hmm. it, it, even in the good moments you're able to really look back at the 60s and be like there, there's there's a root here there's a direct connection um i'm, I'm not I, I feel like i'm kind of rambling but um <laughs> Yeah, essentially, um, it was important because it's it's still relevant. I think is what I'm saying. There's yeah. a lot of it's that that's relevant, and then there's a lot of it too that like uh, for me personally, what something I wanted to capture in the book was like a a, a weird nostalgia. Uh, so referencing things like the Hardy Boys and stuff, referencing that time period felt like maybe just setting it in that time period. The '60s has this this m nostalgic sort of like uh, patina all over it now, I think, especially in pop culture. Uh, and I wanted to be able to kind of capture some of that patina for our book. And and that was like purely an aesthetic thing because 
I knew that the things that we wanted to talk about too, we would have to like not update necessarily because they were relevant, but like reframe certain things too. But we wanted to like firmly set it into a certain time period too, when it just feels like, you know, there were story elements around that as well. Like where we didn't want cell phones, you know, like we wanted to be able to have just like more of this connection between the characters in a, in a more tangible way where you go and meet up with people or whatever uh, you're outside all day, <laughs> uh, which was like, yeah. I don't know. There was just like weird, like aesthetic choices there that I wanted to, I wanted to capture. And, and like a lot of it too, was like fashion and like cars and like, and I just like enjoy drawing that stuff. It feels more organic. So it was, there's a lot of it around that too. So it kind of came together in this way where it was like, we can have commentary through time and th that thread of history uh from then till now and then there's also like we can choose elements of the the aesthetic that we enjoy i think that is a good choice because i i think that's maybe part of the reason why it evokes um the hardy boys for me is like they have that sort of they flash over to sort of commentary and then they kind of go back into their you know their dialogue and then they you know they move forward and something's happening around them and and they're outside and you know it's constant adventure. I love that. Mm -hmm. So that brings us pretty much close to the end. Before um, we go, though, is there anything else you want to add about your process or anything you want to talk, say about the book before we, uh, before I tell everybody where you can get it? Uh, shoot. Well, I, I just want to say thanks to We're on the Street for having us. And uh, the journey started there and it really will, uh, it's just amazing that everything's come full circle in this weird sort of cosmic way. A lot of other things have happened too. And it just feels like really special that we get to share uh, this debut with, with everybody there and all the hard workers that have brought the festival together. Uh, and thanks to you, Carolyn, too, as well. This has yeah. been so much fun. You're an amazing, amazing moderator. I loved your questions. <laughs> oh, yeah, great. Absolutely. I, love to, I love to talking to you both. <laughs> Go ahead, Nathan. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, not at all. I was, I was just echoing where, uh, Drew's sentiment, it's, you know, just extreme gratitude. We're just so grateful for for being here, uh, for the book, even being out there for people to grab and read. It, it's just, it's all so incredible. I can't believe, can't believe it's happening. So thank you. I love that it's full circle too with the word on the street. They're so great. Such a great, it's such a great um, festival. All right. So you can shop t today and you can get the Monaco uh, Twins, um, you can get that at Elemino Bookstore. Elemino, please see the link below, as you can see right here. And it's a graphic novel that you will really much, you will very enjoy. <laughs> Can't even talk. Very enjoy. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> You'll enjoy very much. Thank you. And don't forget to check out um, Word on the Street's digital marketplace as well. Access it through the uh, Word on the Street Toronto website or at the link that's going to be dropped here at the bottom of your YouTube live comment scroll. Thank you both. Oh, you Thank so you. That was so much fun. So much fun to meet you both. And I look forward to someday seeing you in person, Drew and Nathan. Thanks Thank so much, you. Take care, Thanks. everyone. Thanks. Bye. 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 Hello.
Welcome to Word on the Street. We're having a great time here at this festival. Um, and up next, we are going to have two new guests. We have Kenneth Opal. He is the author of numerous. Hi, Ken. How are you? Good to see you again. Nice to see you, Carolyn. Numerous award-winning books for young readers, including the Silverwing Trilogy, Airborne, The Nest, Inkling, and now Bloom, the Bloom series. He lives in Toronto with his wife and three children, and we are we are so glad to have you here today. And also on our panel, we have Alicia Sevigny. Hi. Hi, good to meet you. She's the Thanks. author of The Last Scroll of the Physician, the Desert Prince, um, the first and second books in the Secrets of the Sands series, as well as well acclaimed uh, young adult novels like Summer Constellations and Kissing Frogs. She also, do you live in Toronto? Is that where you, you're coming from? I do, from? yes, I do live in Toronto, yep. Nice. Um, I'm, living, I'm living in St. Catherine, so good to see you all the way across the, the lake here. Um, so our panel today is called Where's the sequel already? <laughs> Which I'm sure kids ask all the time. Where's the next book? I want the next <laughs> book. Um, so um, these two beloved authors are going to tell us a little bit about their anticipated uh, series sequels. And they're going to share a trade secret or two on how they can keep their readers hooked and just excited for more. <laughs> So that's awesome. I'm going to have you read in just a little bit. But before we do that, um, I just want to talk to you guys a little bit about pacing. I find that um, pacing is really an exciting thing when you're building suspense and you're thinking about how we're going to get this moving so readers will keep on coming back. So I'll start with um, Ken, uh, Kenneth, uh, if you don't mind telling us a little bit, how do you go about thinking about pacing when you write a trilogy? Well, I do a lot of my work up front. So I'm a big uh, outliner, um, planner. I like the roadmap. Um, I sort of grew up sort of on a hybrid diet of, of books and movies. So I think um, my imagination is quite visual anyway, and, uh, and my pacing fairly cinematic. Um, the key to me about, about pacing is uh, both sort of constant forward momentum and also variety. Um, it, it's, it's, it's very wearing, I think, for the reader if it's just one thing after another, after another, after another. And there's a lot of stuff in my book. I mean, I feel like I make my characters run too hard sometimes and don't give them any downtime. I'm kind of relentless. But um, <laughs> I think having contrast, um, it might be a, a quiet scene. It might be a meal. It might be a, a humor. Um, just um, amplifies the action when it happens. Um, so cliffhangers are always good. People having to make decisions uh, that are difficult. Um, I mean, true dilemmas where neither choice is particularly great, but it's the best of a bad situation. Um, and just outright, you know, sort of <laughs> blatant cliffhangers where you, know, you have to make someone turn the page to find out what happens next. So I, I think those are the only tricks I have up, up my sleeve. But Oh my um, gosh, she just really needs like 20 tricks. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that's right, the contrast. Oh yeah, yeah, amplify it. Oh yeah, that's awesome. How about you, Alicia? Um, yeah, like a lot of what Kenneth said um, is true for me as well. I find that I, I it's kind of like a rhythm. Um, you know, you're going up and down and all the while going up, but still like kind of like moving um, forward. And I do I do do shorter with my middle grade, shorter chapters and, and do kind of leave things a lot on cliffhangers. Actually, the first book in the series, there's a resolution, but it pretty much ends on a cliffhanger. Um, and the second book picks up right right where it ends um, off, which you know was not recommended to me, but I did. Um, so I did it, and um, I feel like yeah, just keeping the reader reader turning the page, and um, it's it's kind of um, intuitive, and you just have to trust your instincts, and and you know trust rely on like uh, your editors to help, to let you know if like something is kind of you know slow or needs to be picked up or you maybe need to slow down here and kind of explore this a bit more um so so yeah just kind of having that that also that kind of um scenic 
I picture it as a movie when I'm writing as well, like the scenes, like, you know, having the beats and, and you know, the proper, um, the proper kind of pauses and, 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 and forward momentum. So that's, that's how I do it. Nice. And I'm the opposite of Ken. I, I am not a big outliner plotter. Um, well, I wasn't, um, which has come back to kind of kick me in the butt for like writing a trilogy. <laughs> Turns out you, you should actually plot your trilogy before you start writing it. Um, so. <laughs> You guys just answered all my questions for today. No, <laughs> I was going to ask you about if you write outlines. I was going to ask you all these things, but I still might. But um, before we do that, let's go a little bit to Kenneth's uh, actual book, Hatch. Um, so, Kenneth, if you don't mind reading a section from your book. Sure. Um, I'm going to start off right at the beginning. It's just the easiest for everyone. Um, so this is how, how Hatch opens. It's going to be okay. They were rising. They were getting out. Beyond the metal walls of the elevator, Petra heard the rattle and clack of cables pulling them higher. Up, 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 she chanted in her head. Her heart beat against the cage of her ribs. She stared at the control panel, wishing they could go faster. Sweat prickled her back. The elevator was packed with anxious teenagers jostling against each other in their color-coded jumpsuits. She did another quick head count. They were all here. No one left behind, not even Seth. She found him in the crowd, still in his hospital gown. They'd rescued him just in time. Up, up, up. Soon the elevator would jolt to a stop. Soon the doors would open. Soon they'd be free. Beside her, Anaya squeezed her hand. Petra squeezed back. She was so grateful to have her oldest friend in the world with her. It didn't matter that Anaya looked different now. It was still Anaya. And she, Petra, was still the same. Despite everything, I'm still me. The thought was like a rope she clung to, like the elevator cable lifting them out of here. If it frayed and snapped, all was lost. It's going to be okay. From deep below came a rusty squeal. The elevator wobbled and Petra touched her hand against the wall like she was comforting it, giving it a little bit of encouragement. You can do it, elevator. Are we too heavy? She whispered to Anaya. She didn't know why she was whispering. It's a freight elevator, her friend said. We should be fine. Nothing they could do about it now anyway. They were still rising and that was all that mattered. Up, up, up. On the control panel, there were only two buttons. The top one was lit, a pale flickering light beckoning them to the outside. The elevator shuddered and stopped. She turned hopefully to Anaya. Are we there? With a frown, her friend shook her head. Too soon. Too soon? Petra felt like they'd been in here forever. She stared at the doors, willing them to snap open. They did not. Something's wrong, Anaya said. We stuck or something? Frantically, Petra stabbed the top button and then gasped as the elevator dropped a little. From below came the anguished sounds of metal twisting. It sounded like it was being chewed. She didn't want to think about the kind of teeth that could chew metal. She didn't want to think about what could happen if those teeth chewed right through the elevator cable. Another downward tug. The elevator seemed a lot smaller suddenly, the air thinner. She gulped back the panic blooming through her body. We've got to get out of here, she said, looking at the ceiling. The elevator shuddered violently and the light blinked out. And then I do a really mean thing. I, 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 you, I make you turn the page and then it just says two weeks later and <laughs> you never get to find out what happens inside that elevator too much later. Da, da, da. So that's how it opens. Da, da, da. Cliffhanger, right? Love it. There's a cliffhanger. I know. Well, when I read uh, Light Blinked Out, I was like, turn the page really fast. And then I was like, oh. <laughs> mean that way. Yeah. Um, so, as readers, as they grow into being teens, they inevitably face fears along the way. And how do you think that uh, reading about terrifying and fearsome environments, um, and also about fearsome characters, helps readers kind of overcome their own fears? Have you had any um, anybody come back to you and say, you know, I, this really um, connected with me because I have a fear of this? And um. Well, there's a lot of fear and peril in the books packed in. I mean, it had the unfortunate timing, my series of coming out right at, at the beginning of the global pandemic, when a lot of the events that were happening in my book were sort of, you know, being mirrored um, in our daily lives. So I'm not sure if that helped or hindered it or made my book seem a little uh, too forbidding for some readers. Um, I, I heard comments like too close to home, but then other comments like, you know, this is a book that is absolutely right for right now. I mean, for me, books do, you know, two things. They're, they're an, you know, an escape uh, vehicle. Um, uh, they're an entertainment. Um, they're also, I think, in a strange way, a, a comfort, even if what 
you're reading about is is perilous and hazardous. I think inevitably, just by the the nature of reading and the book, is you get to close the book. You get to you know step yeah. away, and it's almost a you know it is a relief. It's a it's a cathartic moment because you can think, oh, thank God that's not happening to me. Yeah, <laughs> my life seems relatively sane and and uh, yeah calm. I'm safe, um, and you can dip back in um, and out of that that world. So that is my only that is my only defense for. Um, you know, the kind of peril that my kids are up against in this sort of, uh, you know, quite apocalyptic scenario I've got them in. Do you ever bring your own fears into your writing, Kenneth? Oh, sure. I mean, it's inevitable. You know, when you're writing, you're always borrowing from yourself um, and those around you, close to you. So, um, yeah, I mean, in the book, um, uh, I mean, you know, there's there's terrible kids. Some of my characters have allergies. Their bodies are are changing. I mean, being being a teenager is a pretty harrowing time at the best of times anyway, you know, because everything is changing, your body's changing, um, your your whole life is changing, your friend groups are changing. And so in, in my group, they have the added, <laughs> they have the added pleasure of having their bodies change in very strange ways. You know, yeah. like growing a reptilian tail or <laughs> body hair or wings. Um, so in a way, I mean, it's almost comic. Um, to me, sometimes and the kids acknowledge this in the book. This, is there anything else? Anything else we could we could handle with handle uh, um, deal with as teenagers? Um, so I think you know it taps into a lot of just sort of almost archetypal, you know, fears and and uh, concerns that teenagers face and everyone faces really. Yeah, yeah, I love that. You know, I'm I'm not afraid of elevators. I'm not very claustrophobic, but I think if I was in that situation, I'd be very fearful. So. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, Alicia, you also bring up some uh, fearsome kind of ideas and thinking about adventure and tension, dealing with different things like snakes and hunger and dunes and sandstorms. Um, <laughs> and there's always a sense of urgency. Um, how do you feel about like um, bringing your fears to the into your book? Um, yeah, my, my fears, I guess, are more on emotional level, personally. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I grew up in, in the Pacific Northwest and, um, you know, it was kind of like wild. It was, it was very, um, very, very much in nature and like very kind of like, you know, running off barefoot all the time. And so I, I love that adventure, like going on adventure, going into the woods, going on a, like, um, on hikes and exploring. And, and, and so that, that kind of, those kind of fears, I actually look at them as like ex exciting and, um, you know, wanting to have adventures. Um, so for me, it's more internal that the fears of maybe, um, my character's fears of, of maybe like, you know, um, not being good enough or not, you know, being, um, you know, doing something that, that maybe hurts someone else or, or, or those kind of like that it's more in, in, I think, emotional, internal, the kind of character spheres that I kind of explore. Um, and then the rest of it, the adventure, I mean, it is, can be exciting and that there is a lot of different things that happen in the book, but, um, um, those are kind of just like, they just deal with them. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. yeah. Well, I think you do a nice job of balancing the action with emotional burdens and then also like the dialogue in your books. Um, maybe you could read a little bit for um, <laughs> I can. This is going to be a little awkward because I, in prepping my space, I left my book back there. So you're going to see me <laughs> go and get my book. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have some background music. It's a little awkward. <laughs> And it would be awesome if I, okay, perfect. I got it. I got the book. It's here. <laughs> I should have. I'm glad I'm not wearing pajama sense. bottoms because that would have been really embarrassing. <laughs> More embarrassing. Uh, all right. So I will read also um, from the beginning, I guess, from the very first page when, um, you know, there, where the, the book just picks up right after the, the, the second, uh, the first book. Um, so it just gets right into it. Um, and uh, chapter one, North, Reb echoes. The scribe looks like he's just tumbled off the back of a donkey. You wish us to go North after Princess Mirat? Yes, I say, my heart and mind are still racing from our confrontation with the queen of Egypt. If we hurry, we may catch up to the Hyksos chieftain and his men. Did you not hear Queen Anat? The princess was given to him just before the queen herself arrived here. You mean when she arrived here to kill us, Reb points out. 
Why should we trust anything the queen says? She came to take the scroll and send us to the underworld. He gestures at the mastaba that houses my parents' bodies that would have held our bodies if not for the intervention of young Prince Tutan and Amez. It is a good thing she only accomplished the first task, Pacer says cheerily, still holding the surgical blade Amez gave him. By the gods' good graces, the physician's knife and the prince's royal command were enough to stop Crooked Nose from entombing us alive. Amez and Prince Tutan are now on their way back to the palace to check on my brother Kai, who is still recovering from the risky surgery Amez performed only hours ago. Crooked Nose, Queen's, uh, Queen Anat's favorite soldier, is with them. He will have the unpleasant task of informing Her Highness that her plan to leave us dead has been thwarted by her only son and heir to the throne, no less. As the cruel soldier is responsible for the fire that killed my parents, I do not feel all that sorry for him. If we are to catch up to the Hyksos chieftain and rescue the princess, we must get moving. Pacer glances up at the sky. Say we do catch up to them, Reb says, crossing his arms. What are we supposed to do? Walk up to the chieftain and say, greetings, we would like the princess back. Maybe we can convince the Hyksos tribe to let us join them, I thought, though my stomach lurches at the outrageous thought. Healers are always needed. Reb snorts. You really think our rivals will welcome three young physicians into their midst? Why not? I speak with more confidence than I feel. Our skills will be of use to them, especially if there is a battle coming. And if they do not welcome us among them, Reb asks, what then? We grab the princess and run, I say grimly. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So um, tell us a little bit about the research you do to write a series. So um, you could talk specifically about these books that you're talking about today. So you have a lot of research. I'll start with Alicia. Yeah, I I did so much research for this series because it takes place 3,500 years ago. So um, the material was a little bit thin, uh, but I, I did make sure to, you know, read as many academic papers as, as I could. Um, I uh, read so much, so much on ancient Egypt. I did so much fact check, fact checking. So when I, when I was writing the first book, The Lost Scroll of the Physician, um, that, that was where I did all of my kind of preliminary research. And I, I really kind of you know, spent years actually um, researching and writing the book. And then I had to write the second one much, much more quickly because um, the, the series was bought and, you know, they wanted to bring out the books relatively quickly. So uh, luckily I had done the preliminary research. So the, the second book wasn't as difficult. And also they go into the desert, into this mysterious oasis. And so I'd done the groundwork, but um, I didn't really, that the more challenging part there was like figuring out the story because I didn't mm -hmm. have it. Right. So well outlined. <laughs> but yes, I, I have spent like a, a lot of time researching and I just made sure to, you know, and I did my best and I, and I you know, there's, we find out new things every day. Um, they're excavating Everest now, which is, you know, Tel Adaba, modern Tel Adaba. And so they're finding out more and more things all, all the time. So I just try to stay informed and, and, and do the best I can to make sure it's historically accurate. That's true too. Oh, I'm getting an echo. I don't know. Are you guys hearing that? It's okay. not bad. It's fine. <laughs> I just like ungracefully went and got my book. You're fine. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't hear it now, so that's great. So yeah, that's true too. It's not only research in the past. It's also keeping up to date on current events and letting that inform you know, what you're you're thinking about and what you're writing about as well. And you might even find that comes into the into the next, you know, in the next part of the trilogy or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. So um, up to you, Kenneth. Actually just um, bouncing off that point and I'm gonna get back to the research. Um, you mentioned that this came out right when the pandemic hit. So were you writing the third book while the pandemic was happening? Yes, pretty much. I think I just I just put Hatch to bed, the second one, and was you know getting into either writing or rewriting Thrive. So that was my yeah my early my early pandemic project, the last book. I mean they were all they were all conceived as one single story. Yeah. In five very what seemed at the time delightfully easy installments. It would be a dream to write. They would just write themselves. Of course, it never turns out that way. But it was structured, you know, as a series of sort of ecological invasions. Book one, you get to meet some interesting uh, flora, and then book two, you get to meet some really terrible fauna. 
And then in book three, you get to meet the people responsible for sending all these terrible uh, living creatures down on our, on our planet. So that was always the concept. Um, so I had that, those, you know, that rough sort of uh, outline in my head as I started. Yeah, it's, it'd be interesting to see um, in retrospect when you go, when it's all done and you look back and you go, I can see that this part was influenced by the pandemic too, right? You know, like just hearing about viruses entering in bodies and all kinds of, you know, different kinds of influences. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure even subconsciously that stuff probably, you know, needled its way into the third book. Yes. <laughs> so tell us about some of the research that you do, Kenna. Well, you know, yeah, even though my books are fantasies, I do try and do as much research as possible just to build a you know foundation of trust in the reader. I figure if the reader believes the, I don't know, the, uh, the basics of what I'm talking about, um, or at least the premise, then they're more likely to, to uh, trust me as I go along and invent outrageous lies and, and really start <laughs> meddling with the reality. Um, so the first book, um, you know, where I'm talking about sort of these, uh, what I call cryptogenic plants, plants of unknown origin. I, I was lucky enough to have the help of a, a friend who's a botanist, uh, Stefan Weber. And he, he, uh, he actually spent a lot of time answering all my questions and even drawing potential cryptogenic plants for me, uh, discussing how they might, you know, seed themselves and propagate and thrive and how they might photosynthesize. So he was actually incredibly helpful. And the interesting thing that I learned is that even though my plants are you know, alien in origin, they're really not very different than a lot of species we have on earth, invasive species that um, really conduct often sort of biological or not biological, but chemical warfare in the soil through fungal networks and, and uh, you know, territorial expansion. Uh, they can be really mean plants. I hadn't realized you know, how mean they can be. Um, and how aggressive. So the, the plants in my book are sort of just, you know, um, earthly terrestrial plants and just, you know, revved up a bit, pumped up. Um, so that was the kind of research I did for the first book. For the second book, honestly, the kind of creatures we have on our own planet are so um, strange and wonderful and varied. Um, sometimes all you need to do is look a little closer at them, you know, magnify some of the things on the bottoms of our oceans or in our soil um, or that, you know, bother us at night and want to suck our blood. Um, you can usually get some pretty scary uh, ideas um, for for other creatures. So that was that for these books. That was the the level of research. Um, you know, I was I was doing. It's kind of fun. Monsters, really. Yeah, I love it. I love that. You know, it, it really connects right now to uh, the curriculum too, like with the the whole steam, you know, movement that's happening. And, and then your books, Alicia, like to grade four and ancient civilizations. I mean, it's, it's great to bring these kinds of books into schools so that they can learn about it in a way that it really suits them as well. I think that's fantastic. Um, we were talking, I was talking to the others about how, um, you know, you always have to bring in the realistic, even with the magical or the mysterious and the, and the terrifying, you bring in the realistic in order to ground the characters. Okay, she's asking if I have headphones uh, on hand. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass it over to, um, Kenneth, do you mind reading a little more section and I'm gonna go see, see if I can find a pair of headsets so that you don't hear the echo. You want more? Yes, more. <laughs> you, you mad? Okay, okay. Uh, uh, well, I'll be nice. I, you know, I sort of left you with that cliffhanger, and then in the book, you it goes to chapter one, where the story starts properly and chronologically. Chapter one is told by Anaya. This wasn't normal rain. It came as a sudden deluge, pockmarking the water and misting Anaya's view of the battered city across the harbor. It lashed down on the field of Deadman's Island where she stood with mom and dad, Petra, and her parents, Seth, and Dr. Stephanie Weber. And it wasn't right. Mostly it was real rain. She could feel it wet against her face, but among the raindrops were ones that were too big to be normal. They didn't soak into the earth, but bounced and settled on the grass like gleaming translucent beads. Hail, mom said. Her mother was a pilot and Anaya knew she'd seen all kinds of severe weather. Hail in May was weird, but not impossible. And Anaya wanted it to be hail. But near her feet, 
One of the gleaming beads quivered, swelled, and then burst. She stepped back with a gasp, something swift and wet uncoiled from inside. It happened so quickly, she couldn't tell the thing's size or shape, except that it seemed too big to come from such a tiny space. In a second, it had burrowed into the earth and disappeared. Did you see that? She cried. Eggs, Dad said, kneeling down as more of them hatched. Their squirming cargo slithered into the grass. He lunged and caught something in his cupped hands, but it squirted between his fingers and was gone. Holy crap, said Seth. What are they? There's hundreds of them, Petra gasped, stamping with her foot. Anaya's shoulders jerked at the sound of a gunshot. Across the field, a soldier fired a pistol uselessly at the ground until someone yelled at him to stop. They're everywhere, she heard another soldier shout. We need specimens, Dr. Weber said with remarkable calm. And I spotted several more trembling eggs nestled among the blades of grass. She snatched the coffee cup from Petra's father and splashed out the contents. Dropping to her knees, she scooped up the eggs and snapped the plastic lid back on. Let's get that to the lab, Dr. Weber said, fast. As quickly as it had come, the rain subsided, and I rushed toward the main building. She felt like she was clutching a grenade. Against the waxed paper was a sudden churning. Are we good? I don't want to keep reading. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I got my earphones. No one needs to hear more of that. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just I kept hearing echoes. So um, now I have my earphones. Earphones. Can you hear me? Okay. With my earphones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, you know, Alicia, you mentioned earlier that you, um, when you write your books, you try to think about them as like movies, right? Like watching mm -hmm. a movie and creating the scene. I'm curious, Kenneth, do you do that as well? Do you think of it as like sort of you're watching the scenes as a movie or is it more like more internalized as a first person kind of viewpoint, like feeling as though the action is actually happening to you? So I'll let Kenneth answer and then we'll go to Alicia and then I'll, uh, we'll go back to that question, okay? I honestly, I feel like it's both. Um, I, I do feel like when I'm writing a scene, especially a, an action scene or a scene where there's a lot of physical you know, movement, uh, I do feel a bit like director, choreographer, um, you know, lighting designer, editor. Um, I, to a certain extent, I feel like I'm trying to paint the images in the, in the reader's mind as economically and as you know forcefully and vividly as possible. Um, they inevitably do a lot of the work, filling in some of the details. Um, but that's sort of that's the that's sort of the you know the surface of the of of the story. And you know it's uh, that's great, but it's usually good if if your character is you know a, a surrogate uh, for the for the reader, so they feel that they're in the skin of the main character, experiencing what they're they're undergoing because you know event is is kind of a neutral thing. Um, it's how someone reacts to the event, uh, the danger, the peril, the joy that really um, brings it to life for the reader. So yeah, I'm 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 directing and art directing, but I'm also trying to always you know ask myself how what would I be thinking? How would I be acting or reacting? How do I feel this in my in my body? How does it how does it show? So it's sort of a dual. You know, you're outside and inside um, your own oh, body. Alicia, um, would you would you do you mind reading a little bit more of your book and then um, we can yes. talk about that question because I want to I want to kind of get that question in from you as well. Do you, do you want me to read first or answer the question first? How about you read first and okay. then we'll like hear about your process. Okay, awesome. Um, so now I have to find a different <laughs> selection. Um, okay, got one. All right, so this is when they are have been traveling in the desert for a few days. They're they're feeling a little bit tired and beaten down. Um, and, uh, you know, they've been, you know, they're just, things are looking grim. All right, so. We reach the shade of the small knot of palms, startling some birds from their perch, maybe even the same ones we followed to get here. I drop the satchel under a palm and head straight to the pond's edge, eager for a drink. I want nothing more than to dive into the water. My foot sinks deep into the wet sand. Then my other foot vanishes, my leg sinking to mid-calf. I try to lift my back foot up and bring it forward. It does not budge, and my movements make me sink even more. Struggling to free myself only gets me more stuck, but I'm almost up to my waist before I realize what is happening. Stasha, stop moving, Peppy shouts. Quick sand. Stay calm, Peppy instructs. That's easy for you to say. Panic rises as I sink further, the sand now almost up to my chest. You are not being swallowed by the desert. The sands will not swallow you. 
Pepe and Nefer have stopped a palm tree away. Pacer strides by them, extending his hand to pull me out. Pepe grabs his arm and yanks him back. What are you doing? Pacer says angrily, shaking off Pepe's grip. I mean to give her my hand. And then you will be stuck as well, Pepe says. Listen to me, Sasha. Stop moving. The more you fight the sand, the more it will pull you in, sucking the strength from your body. He points at the sun, which is climbing higher into the sky, the heat of the day rising along with it. The danger comes not from below, but from above. What am I to do? I ask, holding my arms at shoulder height. The soupy clay slurps up my body, making it almost impossible to move. Bring your legs to the surface, Pepe instructs. You will need to crawl out. I try to lift a leg, but the sand will not release it. My limbs feel heavy, like they no longer belong to me, but are becoming part of the desert itself. It's not working. Whoa. Yeah, I'm not scared of sand either, but in that situation, I'd be very afraid. <laughs> So is, that, is that official your... advice, uh, Alicia, on how to get out of quicksand? Should you try, should you try and bring I your legs up? I actually researched that, and it is. That so, works? Yeah. I want to so, know. Is that, you, you need know, some kind of fulcrum. Later. So we throw her a stick, just to yeah. kind of spoil her. But yes, yeah. you need a fulcrum to put under your, your hips in and leverage and get your legs to full. And then you kind of have to crawl right. and, and kind of roll over onto the lip of, of the harder surface. So yes, I did research that. Awesome. <laughs> I love that. Oh, I am ready. I'm ready. <laughs> ready for if you that get stuck. That, that reminds me of when you get out of ice. If you fall into ice, you're supposed to do the same kind of thing. Try to thing. get your body flat, like a like a. You try to come yes. up like a a dolphin or something, and just flop onto it, and then kind of shimmy, shimmy. <laughs> shimmy on the ice, shimmy, shimmy on the ice. Yeah, this is exactly. what we hear. You know, when we we present these kind of very useful messages i think yeah, exactly that's why we're all kids writers we love we love being yeah, i'm very scared if somebody actually looks at my computer and sees like the things that i've googled i'm like oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so back to the question about how you see it as you're writing it so you you mentioned before that you see it like a movie um scenes in front of you but then uh, kenneth also mentioned going back and forth between a perspective that's more first person and then a perspective that's more third person. So what about your process? Yeah, mine is mine's very similar. Um, you know, I do see it uh, unfolding as a movie, but I also I, I'm there, I'm in it. So I'm like, what am I doing? How am I feeling? Um, and then, you know, I kind of when I'm writing, I, I kind of get the action out and then I go back and, and, and you kind of add layers like, you know, add detail here and this here and then maybe you use this word already up here. So then you take that one out. So it's 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 yeah, it's, I try to be in it as much as I can and just let the words flow and turn that little editor button or whatever off. Um, and then I, I go back and I layer in, I layer it and I layer it and I layer it until it's how I want it. It's so interesting to me, like thinking about all those layers, because that's what makes the book so nuanced, but it also makes the book feel so real. And even though you're writing about fantastical things that a lot of people have never experienced or will never experience because it's like total fantasy, um, at the same time, it feels real. It feels like it's right here and now. And that's, that's the, uh, the effect of all the layers that you've added. So nice job. All right, so there's a there's a saying that nothing sells a we're talking about um, series, so nothing sells a book like a second book. Um, mm -hmm. But a question that I always wonder about uh, is what happens though when a kid comes across a book and it's the second book or the third book and they read that first. So um, what do you do or do you even think about this about kids that might not have access to like every book in the right order. Do you ever think like, what What do you have to put into the book so that they can understand it? Um, that's just something I think about because I mean, you'll go to the library and let's say you're, the first book is like gone, right? Somebody's borrowed it already. And I remember reading Harry Potter like that. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm just wondering what you do so that um, you kind of catch people up as well or it doesn't matter maybe it doesn't matter that they didn't read the first book i don't know maybe yeah. they could read it i don't know what are your thoughts uh it's a tricky it's a tricky balance you want to have the backstory in there but you want to weave it 
in such a way so that it's not too much. Um, so you you need to kind of let people know what's what's going on and remind them if, if something is important that is in the second second or third book. Um, but it, it's it that was something that I kind of had to learn to do um, because I had never written a trilogy before. So the fine art of backstory, I suppose, is um, is something that you know I I've been working on for sure. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've, I've written several series, but with my former series, um, the previous series, the Silverwing books and the Airborne books, I, I wrote one at a time and didn't necessarily know I was going to write any more. So they felt more like standalones, which is, I actually prefer that way of writing um, than, uh, you know, to writing a, a, a trilogy outright, like the like the mm -hmm. Blue series, because then you really are, you really are um, committed and you need to you need to do the whole story in a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm actually surprised because um, I do get kids who say they read the books out of order and it was still OK. Um, so I think um, I think kids are sort of more uh, sort of accepting and do more of the work than than we might think. Um, and you, you do try and give, as Alicia said, you know, you see the the, the um, what happened in the previous book in the opening. And you try and do it gracefully. The temptation is just to like put a huge block of dialogue <laughs> somewhere <in the> that. <laughs> You try and weave it in, you know, sort of slow, yeah. if, if at all possible. Yeah. yeah, when you get a big passage of epilogue, you're like, ah, oh, come on, keep it going, keep it going. So yeah, trying to weave it in, so important, especially since um, in this day and age, everybody's like fast, everything's fast, right? Um, kids yeah. are looking at like Instagram pictures like fast. So yeah, to have these big chunks of text where you're like, okay, that's all backstory, yeah. That doesn't yeah. work so much today. Yeah. What about your characters? So um, first of all, you have to hold in your head, you know, like with a trilogy, you're going to have a lot more characters than maybe you would have with just a single standalone book. So, and, and that includes characters that sometimes you don't even meet until, you know, further on. Are you planning those characters in advance? Are you thinking, okay, at this point, at some point they're going to have a scene where they meet this new character or are you just um just encountering it as you go sort of like creating the counter the the character as you write what are your thoughts about that uh alicia <laughs> uh, well um for me i have like the the bigger maybe the bigger characters like the bigger one or two characters but yeah just i'm i'm working on the third um in the trilogy right now and you know like people i'm writing and then this characters just pop up and I just keep writing okay this is this hi nice to meet you and 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 it's like they just kind of introduce themselves and then you you keep writing so um yeah so I, I had like you know like the one or what like I didn't have um I don't think about every little little character when I start writing and, and they just kind of reveal themselves to me as I, I'm writing and um yeah that's kind of how I work <laughs> nice the three main characters in my series are you know, that was a lot of work just to come up with three point of view. Yeah. Characters. So, I mean, that and that was what took the most time just in preparing the whole the whole trilogy um, was making sure the characters were were right and, you know, differentiated and had different sort of voices, mm -hmm. desires and needs and backstories. So I think in terms of secondary characters, I left those book by book. I'm not sure I had that, you know, those other, you know, irritating people planned out yet, you know, there's just yeah. more people to get to meet at the party and you have to spend time with them and uh, it's, it's endless trying to get them to talk about themselves. Such a drag, <laughs> um, but so necessary, so necessary. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, um, your characters are all so fully developed and that's like something that I know that as, as, as a professor of, um, teachers and also thinking about the ways kids are trying to write characters sometimes some of the hardest things to work on even though it seems like it would be very easy it's hard to like what you said um think about their backstory their personal needs their motivations that kind of thing because what happens often is um when you're when you're a beginning writer you start thinking about um like from your own perspective, right? So it's hard to kind of take on another totally different perspective in order to engage in that sort of way. So um, you guys um, do nice mentorship on how to how to do that. I think that's fantastic. So um, is there anything else that you would like, we're getting close to the end here, but um, just 
just wanting to say, is there anything else you would like to say about your book or some maybe something that's surprising that happened to you in the process? Um, just leave us on a like excited high note. What happened that was something that was really exciting during your process of writing? Something exciting. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got stuck in quicksand. No, I didn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> I um, for for me, like I. Um, the research is what I, I love. I, I'm a big fan um, I'm of ancient civilizations, particularly ancient Egypt, um, amateur Egyptologist. And um, I I love what I love about this series that it's based on a really cool time that people don't know a lot about and exploring that time. Um, and, and also it's based on a real ancient um, artifact that you can actually see in the New York uh, Museum of Medicine. Um, so it's based on this real scroll um, that is a the center of the series and it's, it's a real uh, papyrus and it, it existed and it was believed to have written be, be written probably 1000 years before the characters themselves find it so um so that was really cool just just the finding about and and i'll doing all the research and finding out all the neat things and you know and how advanced you know egyptian medicine was actually for the time and um and just uh, yeah, so that was uh, that was really exciting for me. Is just uh, and then just drawing the parallels between ancient times and modern day. So I love that. Yeah. What about apart you, from, Pat? Apart from finding out how mean plants can be, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but I actually I do have a question for Alicia. Um, you wrote. I noticed you're writing in um, in present tense. Yes. And I thought, did you did you have a, a decision sort of? Um, meeting with yourself where you wondered if it should be past tense or present tense. And I mean, it seems I, I've written, I've written in the present tense in a historical setting and it seems almost um, counterintuitive, something that happened so long right. ago to write about it in the present tense. So what was your, what was your thinking like behind that? Um, I didn't actually even think about it too much. Um, I, so my, my, my previous books were in present tense as well. My young adult novels, cause you know, that's kind of very common for a young adult. Mm -hmm. And then when I, and this is, I think my, my, the series is actually more upper middle grade. So um, because the characters, even though they're 13, 14, 15, that's kind of like they were adults back then in ancient Egypt. So, um, so I feel like, they were kind of, I guess, young adults, and I kind of just transitioned that voice, and um, I just imagine myself back there, you know, um, even like, you know, did a little exploration, <laughs> a little yeah, meditation. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess it was just, um, it was just, a, it was a natural, just a natural choice, and and I didn't even think actually about putting it in past tense, but that's actually a really good, good observation. Yeah, no, it, it feels comfortable. It's kind of interesting because I think when you're reading a book. Um, no matter what tense is written in, it's always sort of the present tense in your mind because you're experiencing right. it for the first time. You really are, you know, tall and tense and purposes there now. Um, yeah. It's funny how you uh, you just totally forget um, what tense the book is written in. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I wanted like the pe pe readers to feel like they were kind of experiencing everything for the first time and going along on this journey with sent with Sasha and all the other characters that are in the book. So yeah, yeah I feel present tense worked for it. Nice. Yeah, I think it takes away the uh, wall of disbelief yeah. too, because yeah, it does make it feel more real when you're writing in present tense and happening right now to you. Mm -hmm. I think that would also build the tension as well. The fact that it's in present tense, that might also be a way to do that. Well, I thank you so much. Um, if you would like to purchase um, these books that we've been talking about today, you can um, take a look at the uh, today's book list with Elemento Bookstore, elemento.ca, or you can see it down at the bottom of your screen right now if you would like to purchase a book. Also, don't forget to check out Word on the Street's digital marketplace. Access it, uh, you can get to it through the Word on the Street Toronto website, and you can see right down below that it's right here on our screen right now. So please check it out rewatch as many times as you like and um just wanted to say thank you to, to both of you so much thank it's you I'm thank you so much yeah to have had this opportunity and thank you for it on the street as always what a fantastic festival thank you oh, thank you yeah. Yeah, just wanted to say a quick shout out, Alicia, Kenneth, it's been a pleasure, 45 minutes, I think. It's been wonderful and I cannot fathom doing what any of you three do at all, um, which is why I will forever just read the books. And honestly, my TBR 
has grown like that after like all the panels today. So I'm incredibly thankful and thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. I also want to say thank you to the, to the viewers as well who are like oh, watching yes. from home. And we hope you enjoyed the program today and we hope you'll come back next year as well. Oh, yeah. please do. Maybe in person. We'll see. Yeah. Great festival. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you Bye. so much. All right. So we're just about to head into a quick little break, a 15-minute break, and we will be resuming at 2 p.m. with a special presentation with First Nation Community Read. See you again soon.
Hello everyone and welcome back to our stream. Up next, we are excited to be hosting the First Nation Communities Read Award. Please welcome Nancy Cooper, coordinator at the Southern Ontario Library Services for FNCR to get things started. Hey, how's it going? Hello, Nancy, how are you? Good, you survived the weekend almost. Almost, we're <laughs> almost there. <laughs> That's so, great, good for you. Thank you. Um, so I'll turn it over to you and give you the stage to uh, get things started. Okay, well, hi everybody, I'm Nancy Cooper and I'm the uh, First Nation Communities Read Coordinator at the Southern Ontario Library Service and I get to coordinate a national book award um, that was started in 2003 by First Nation librarians in Ontario. And it has grown to um, be this amazing national award. And we've, we're so lucky to have the ongoing support of the Periodical Marketers of Canada. And uh, we're all very grateful for the generous support of Indigenous literature provided by the Periodical Marketers of Canada. It's a national association of magazine and book wholesalers who've created and sponsored the annual PMC Indigenous Literature Awards, which have become a much sought after and important form of recognition for Indigenous authors across Canada. So I and we are delighted to have Peter Olson of the Periodical Marketers of Canada with us today to recognize and introduce the winners of these prestigious awards for 2021. Before we um, get Peter on though, we have a special surprise. Clayton, uh, one of our winners, asked if it would be okay if he and his brother uh, sang a song for us to get started. So we're gonna put Clayton on. And then Peter, once that's done, we'll get you to do the award presentation. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Good, good. Um, I'm grateful to be here. My brother didn't show up yet, um, but I'm willing to share a song with you. Um, Thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm honored to be to be here and uh, sharing these gifts and um, honored to be a part of the books and a part of the the group here and um, your new family to me. So oh, um, nice. I'm grateful to, to be here to share with you. Um, I'll sing a, a, an eagle song. So um, for new beginnings, um, new things in our lives, this is a new beginning for me. So it's uh, it's been such a blessing. I, I have no words to, to express it. Um, the best way I can express it is through song. So I'm going to share a song with you. Great. Thank you.
Clayton, that was beautiful. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Peter Olson now to do the um, award presentation for the authors. Peter, you're up. Great. Well, thanks, Nancy. Thanks for the introduction. And Clayton, thanks for the the song. It was beautiful. It was sensational. Uh, and hello to our all of our online viewers. I'm proud to present represent Periodical Markers of Canada in introducing the winners of the 2021 PMC. Indigenous Literature Awards. And I guess I'll say I miss being uh, personally close to everybody here, which we've done in other years. And, but this is a year of uh, change and difference. So we'll do it online, yep. which is great. And it's nice to see everybody online. Uh, for the past seven years, our organization has had the great privilege of sponsoring this award, which recognizes the creators of outstanding Indigenous literature. The program, includes awards in two categories, children's and young adult, adult. And the response from Indigenous authors across the country has been very great gratifying. A jury of librarians from First Nation Public Libraries in Ontario, supported by the Southern Ontario Library Service, selected the winning submissions from Indigenous titles submitted by Canadian publishers. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce the winners of the 2021 PMC Indigenous Literature Awards, and the $3,000 cash awards that go with them to two outstanding Indigenous authors. The winner in the children's category is Clayton Gauthier, a Cree Deca multimedia artist from Prince George, BC. We just saw another one of his medias he operates in, and I look forward to talking about his totem pole and carving um, work that he does, who is recognized for the charming bilingual work he wrote and illustrated wrote and illustrated, which is pretty awesome, entitled The Bear's Medicine, published by Thetis Books. Clayton is online with us today, as you, as you saw, and I'd like to congratulate him on this well-deserved recognition and ask him to tell us a story uh, behind The Bear's Medicine. Clayton. Thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here. And um, My background, my bloodline is Cree and Daketh. Um, you know, learning learning in this journey about the land and the animals that, that guide us and that teach us many things has, um, has brought me to a higher understanding of, of this world and, and my, my relationship with the land. And um, the, so these children's books that I've written, uh, this is the second one, The, the Bear's Medicine, um, they're revolved around the animals and um, the animals have have powerful gifts that they give us, and um, if we're mindful of them, we can, we can learn so much from them. And you know, the animals have have a have a power in this world. They they know what they need to do every every day. They get up. They they know their job. They know their purpose here. They know what they need to do. They know um, every season. They know what to do. Um, so do we know what to do? Do we know our job? What makes us happy? What brings us, um, 
what lights our fire. What are the things that uh, we truly enjoy? And for me, it's art. I, I love doing art. And when when the Bears Medicine came to light, um, after my first book was written, it, it inspired me to write another one. And um, revolving around the bear and, and the medicine the bear blesses us with. And um, it roughly took about a month to complete um, keeping it in, in a sense uh, for children to to be exposed. I, I work with a lot of children in, in the schools and the community here. And, you know, our, our impact, you know, a lot of the things like from my growing up, a lot of the teachings that that I that I've held on to were, were when I was a kid, when I was, uh, you know, nine years old and up. I, I was learning about different forms of art, different animals, different stories. Um, those things stuck with me all my life. So I, I really, truly feel that the kids have that power to to keep passing on these these stories and keep passing on these teachings. And so um, that's how it came to light. And um, I, I pictured everything first in my mind. Um, I'm, re I'm really a visual person, and as I pictured them, I, I, I wrote down what I felt the bear could, could teach us and um, what are the lessons that could be involved with this book. So that's how it came to light. Well, that's great. Um, I, I have a question on, um, on the medicine, uh, and I, I have my own belief on what the medicine is. Tell us what, and for many people who may be listening, and watching, they may not have seen the book yet. Uh, describe what the bear's medicine is, what the actual medicine is. Well, um, every nation, every territory has their own um, teachings and their own blessings of different stories on the land with different animals. Um, in in this, you know, we all hold medicine in in a sense of um, our words, our thoughts, our feelings, we all hold medicine. So um, what, what is the medicine that we want to share? And, and the bear taught us when, when the salmon came, we followed the bear and the bear taught us when the salmon came here, the bear taught us uh, about the berries, the bear taught us about uh, digging roots, finding the healthy roots that we use still today. Um, so um, having those teachings also, the, the the bear is is a is the medicine keeper of the land. Without the bear, the the land wouldn't be what it is. We wouldn't have the medicine every year. The bear is the one that keeps it clean and does all the work. And um, they travel around. They they do their job every summer and uh, to keep this medicine clean and going for us. Well, well great, good answer. I I just looked at it. I thought the medicine may be nature, but I think my answer is too simplistic versus what you just gave us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It goes deep. It goes as deep as you, as you look at it. Um, well, great. And, uh, Clayton, tell us about what other art you're doing and the carving. Uh, and we can see some of the carvings in behind you. They're sensational. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. I've been doing um, some of these projects from home and, um, with all this stuff going on, um, things have sh shifted a bit, and I've been doing a lot of projects at home. Um, all of these pieces have stories and have have personal meaning in my journey. Um, they hold a lot of um, a lot of blessings in my life, and um, like we're all connected to certain animals in our life. We're born in this world and we always we're always loving a certain animal we're always connected right from the start and um understanding that animal makes you understand yourself too so um uh, i've always been connected to eagles and um this carving here um the eagle come comes and visits me sometimes and blesses me and um uh, i'm a really sensitive person and I've, I've come to have a, uh, a powerful relationship with, with the uh, eagle. And um, 
the seven stars on this carving is the seven sacred teachings, the seven um, sacred ceremonies. Uh, seven is a big number within our culture and um, within our uh, teachings. Um, there's uh, seven sacred medicines too. Uh, so um, it falls into all of that. And uh, what's our connection to the land? And the moon has always been, con uh, been connected to the moon too. So, um, so there's many deep stories within these pieces. Oh, they're beautiful. And that, thanks for that. Uh, a question, how any advice you would have for a young artist or a young uh, a young writer or illustrator? I, I, you know, keep producing, keep doing what you love. It's it's a it's a need. There's there's so much room in this world for all of us to to thrive and share our art. Uh, I, as a, when I was young, I've always pictured, I would look around town and it's like, how come there's no art around? And, um, you know, I've always envisioned a, a, a beautiful place that we can live in and art is, art is what changes the world. And um, as you practice and, and start loving the art forms that you like to, like to draw and paint, keep practicing, keep doing it. It's so healing. Um, the art teaches me so much every day, and you you learn so much about yourself as you're as you're working on these things. And um, also, people you don't see what what we see. Um, I don't see what you see from my work. Um, we're always uh, learning in that sense too, and uh, gaining confidence, um, trusting your gifts, and and sharing the stories that you need to share and. We all have stories to share. We all hold stories in our hearts. And I, I hope you guys keep keep producing what you love because it, it's such a beautiful feeling. Like, man, I'm honored to be here. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, it's great to be here with you. Um, I'm not sure if we can take any questions uh, um, from the uh, from Nancy or anyone else who's on the line. Um, and I'll, I'll just maybe wait for a prompt uh, over on my uh uh, chat screen here, Clayton, but tell me, Clayton, have you always been uh, artistically inclined or did it hit you at a certain time in life, like later? So maybe I'm not necessarily an artist, but I guess I have some artistic ability. Uh, can you release it later in life, do you think, or when did you start to, when did you start to uh, really uh, uh, finding out and figuring out that you were an artist and a writer and an illustrator, et cetera? I've always loved art um, ever since I was young, uh, I've always, it was something that I've always needed. It was, it was like my medicine, uh, in a sense, I, I need it every day. And, um, yeah. um, I started doing art, you know, here and there when I was young, but when I started to do it a lot more, it was around 14, 13, 14, I started to draw a lot more. And, and then, then I started learning more of the animals and, different teachings and started learning different art forms. And as, as I started to do that, I started having other artists come into my life. Uh, um, some of my family, my uncles, um, my grandpa was an artist and um, having them share their stories and share their techniques with me. And yeah. Uh, and then also have another artist, um, a master carver, Peter George. He, he had a big influence on my life and, um, he shared a lot of the clan teachings in our clan ways. So, um, uh, we produced a, a carving together. I was an apprentice here in Prince George and we produced a, a big carving for the community and that really opened so much more doors for me. And so, um, art has always been here. It's always been something I need. Yeah. Well, great. Well, it shows. Well, Clayton, have you, have you had anything else to add or otherwise we'll, uh, we'll thank you. We'll move on to our, our, our next, uh, winner. Um, I, I want to, um, just share, share with the, with the kids, keep doing your art, keep sharing your art. Um, you know, we all have gifts and art, art is not just painting or carving. Art is singing. It's, it's dancing. It's drumming. Uh, Art is art is um, 
is so universal. Art is what changes the world. And uh, whatever form of art you love, keep doing it. Keep doing it. And um, keep filling your heart. Great. Awesome. Well, and thanks for that beautiful bonus song we got uh, from you, Clayton. That was great. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Clayton. And congratulations again on on the, really the wonderful way you brought a bear's eye view of the natural world to, to young readers. So next, our award winner in the young adult adult category is writer-broadcaster Drew Hayden Taylor from the Curve Lake First Nation near Peterborough uh, for his work, Chasing Painted Horses, published by Cormorant Press. So congratulations to Drew who is online with us today. Drew, welcome. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, well, and and who who better to tell us about your book uh, than you? And uh, what a magical fable-like quality about it! Uh, and so so tell us about it, Drew, please. Oh, I've always had trouble putting this story into just a simple line or two because uh, it takes place in two different time periods. But essentially, it's a story of uh, uh, four kids, uh, three who are friends, and one sort of an outsider that makes her way into their friendship and things happen. She happens to be able to draw a magnificent image of a horse on a wall, on anything practically, and so amazing that it, it, it leaves an impact on the three kids so much. But unfortunately, the girl comes from a dysfunctional family, things happen, and she ends up leaving the reserve, and they end up wondering whatever happened to her. Cut forward 30 years to one of them is a police officer in Toronto is walking down a street and uh, sees some graffiti that looks startlingly familiar, like the famous horse that the young girl named Danielle had drawn uh, all those years ago. And he gets curious about what's happened to her, where is she, is she still alive? And tries to find out uh, who she is and where she is. Well, great, and it, you know, as, as Clayton was telling us, his book was focused on a bear. And mine and, is you know, on a horse. Yeah, and what better? I mean, what two great animals? Uh, and you know, the sort of I was with a I was with a horse last night, and I'm kind of a city guy. I'm living in, in Oakville. I'm a Vancouver, BC born and raised guy. That's why I got to talk to you about the beachcombers a little bit later on. Uh, you're probably tired of talking about that, but but oh you know, my I was, God, that was so long. That was thirty years, thirty five years ago, many winters ago. Many of our many many of our listeners and people online uh, may not know, you know, exactly. They're too young for the beachgoers. Uh, it'll come back again, I guess. But last night, as a city guy, I don't see many horses. But last night, I was up on a farm, uh, and uh, with with three horses, and just the majesty of the animal and what what they can tell for us and do for us. And one was twenty five years old and really uh, is almost out to pasture, and and the owner of the horse. Uh, is just, you know, basically the caretaker and just, you know, loving the horse and, and, and caring for the horse and, and buying carrots in a, in a bag of a, a hundred pound bag of carrots each week <laughs> for these horses. So, so what a great animal to pick and, and maybe tell us a little bit more. Do you have a background in horses or or none whatsoever? No, no. But for me, um, it actually goes back like a lot of writers, I start with a single thought, image, idea, whatever, and then I start adding stuff onto it. It's like it's like you have a word and you add a prefix and a suffix and you just keep doing it until you actually have a story. And one, um, this, this particular story had a couple of genesis or genesi or however you want to do uh, plural genesis. Um, one was at a dinner party where a friend of mine told me uh, when she was growing up in uh, some suburb of Ottawa, her mother used to invite kids over to draw pictures on the wall and she would give them um, a present, a prize. And this one little girl would show up and she'd draw a horse and she'd draw the same horse over and over and over again. And it was a real shy little girl. And then one day she just uh, stopped coming. And this is just in, in, in suburban Ottawa. And uh, my friend said she often wondered whatever happened to that girl. And that sort of stuck in my head and I began to play around with it. And then I remember going to a country fair with my grandfather years and years and years ago when I was a kid and seeing this, uh, this horse on a, like a, one of those, uh, like a pony that you get kids on to ride and they go around in a circle and it wore a groove in the, in the ground. And I just remember looking at that horse and that horse looked so sad, so miserable. This is all it's doing for its entire life, carrying little kids in a circle. That's its existence. And that image stayed with me as a kid. So eventually I put those two images together 
talk about the about the power of art, the power of creativity, and the power of friendship. Well, great, and you can't you can't have a better friendship than with a horse. So I've told, especially for young girls, I'm told there's an yeah. affinity between them. Yeah, yeah. There's no question. There's no question. Now, this is your uh, Drew. This is your second book. Uh, was it easier to write your second book than your first book, or how does that go as a writer? This is my thirty-third book. Or oh, it's your third book? Okay, sorry. Thirty-third. Thirty-third book, really? Oh, I didn't. I I didn't realize you're that, that prolific. I I know you. I see in your bio that you're doing. Uh, you're a playwright and everything else, but I didn't realize thirty-three books. Yep. Well, does number thirty-three get easier than number one? Uh, number one was a play. The first three were published plays. Okay. Um, yep. This is my third uh, novel. Third novel. Okay. And I like. I've got collections of. Uh, short stories and and um, non-fiction and plays etc yeah. etc etc cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whether this one is easy or not it's hard to say this one has the longest gestation period of any project i've worked on <laughs> um i'd say it has about 20 25 years it took to write it because really? it started out as a short story in a collection i published a long time ago called fearless warriors and then i it, it stayed with me i um i wrote it but it wouldn't go away and then I wrote it as a one act play for kids. And then um, that I was very happy with that. And then but it's again, it wouldn't go away. It kept saying there's more to this story. Write us, write us. So then I just sat down and I just started working on it as a novel. And uh, so the final product is, as you saw, Chasing Painted Horses, the yeah. original short story and play. It was called Girl Who Loved Her Horses. Ah, OK. Well, great. And, and uh, any advice you would have to an aspiring uh, playwright, uh, author, um, you know, someone starting out in the business? Oh, a couple things. I have to tell a lot of young people. One, there's no such thing as a good writer, only a good rewriter. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I do it a minimum of three drafts, possibly four yeah. or five. First draft is for the story. Second draft is for the characters. Uh, third draft is basically tying up all the loose ends and just making sure everything runs together. The second thing I always tell young people is, um, what is what is the second thing? Um, that's right. All good writers are good readers and all great writers are great readers. So yeah. I, you I, want, I, that's good advice. That? Yeah. You want to, uh, yeah. The, I mean, I have written, as you know, um, plays, novels, short stories. I've written creative nonfiction. I've written television. I've written documentaries, etc. cetera. Um, and yet I've never taken a writing course in my life. <laughs> I learned from reading. Every book I read, um, it helped me understand story structure, character arcs on an unconscious or subconscious level. So the more I read, the more I understood what makes a book work. So the more you read, the more you have an understanding of the writing process. Well, that's great. That's music to the ears of a book distributor. Excellent. Yep. And Drew, how did you get started? I mean, you say you didn't have any formal training. I mean, and you've, you've had a, a, a lengthy and very successful career. How, what was your, how did you get started in your, in your career? Well, I went to college for radio and television broadcasting way back when. And when I graduated, I mean, things were happening so quickly that within five years, everything I learned had become uh, ancient. So um, I started writing just articles and essays um, uh, for the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, Now Magazine, all these different magazines all the time. Um, just basically writing my opinion of situations. Um I would take topics or issues and give them a unique, usually humorous spin. And then from there, through a series of circumstances, having never done it before, I got myself an opportunity to write an episode of The Beachcombers when I was 25. And then two, uh, then the following year, I was asked if I wanted to be the writer in residence for Native Earth, Canada's premier indigenous theater company, having never written a play. I did that, and then after that, I started um, uh, writing um, more and more creative nonfiction, and then I started writing short stories, then I started writing novels. Just basically, um, because in the 21st century, there's, I, I, sorry, I'm going all over the place here. Let me start off by saying 
I consider myself a contemporary storyteller above all else. And the thing about a contemporary storyteller is in the 21st century, there's so many ways to tell a story. It used to be oral, just oral narrative. Then you had print and then you had radio, you had theater, you had movies and gradually you go into television. But in terms of the 21st century today, there's so many different ways of telling a story. Even video games have deep and intricate narratives within them. So it, it, as, a, as somebody who calls himself a storyteller, I'm very conscious, very aware, and um, I'm very intrigued by the fact there's so many different ways to tell stories. And I'm going out and I'm seeing how many different ways I can tell a story. Well, great. Well, keep telling us stories. And tell me just quickly, just for me, maybe uh, what was the Beachcombers episode? What story was that? And see if I can remember this one or not. It was in the, the uh, what was it, this, uh, sorry, it was called, what was it called? That was so long ago, A House Divided. And it's where um, Jesse's wife, Laurel, gets an offer, who worked at a bank, gets an offer from her band uh, office to come and be the band manager, the financial officer for the reserve. And she goes and applies for it. And if she gets the job, means she'll have to move there. And it just might break up the family. Ah, okay, great, great. And did you ever get a chance to get up to Gibson's? Like, did they they film it at Gibson's at Molly's Reach and all that, right? Did you did you ever get a I, chance? I to wrote that there? episode having never been to, to uh, <laughs> British Columbia, and I wrote an episode of uh, North of Sixty having never been to the Northwest Territories. <laughs> You're good. Have you ever been? Have you ever been since to? to oh yeah, yeah. I've been almost everywhere yeah. in Canada since, except okay, I, for as of yet, I've not been to Nunavut yet. But hope springs eternal. Well, great. Well, there's still lots of time. Well, great. Uh, well, again, I don't, I don't know if anyone else has any questions, Nancy or anyone else. Um, and uh, uh, and and Drew, I don't know if you have questions for me, but uh, it's great talking to What's you. What's the meaning of life? What's the meaning of life? Well, you know. I mean, I think it's what you're talking about. What you're doing is storytelling. You know, I tell our kids lots of stories and and you know try and teach them you know how to live and how to you know how to uh, take the ups and downs and all that sort of stuff. And generally, it's worked out pretty well. Uh, but yeah, what's the what's the meaning of life? Well, we we could go on for a bit. <laughs> but I think it I think it's storytelling. I think it's being kind. I think it's it's growing. It's learning. All those kind of things. And these are the kind of things that you know. Uh, books can help us too. Oh, drink, drink to that. Yeah, great. Well, fantastic, Drew. Thanks for uh, thanks for a great conversation. Uh, let me just see if I can find my place. So, thanks, Drew, again, and congratulations. You know, on such a compelling, you know, First Nations fantasy. Uh, and on behalf of of my colleagues at the Periodical Marketers, uh, I would again like to extend our sincere congratulations to this year's winning authors. And we have a, a, a couple plaques, one for each of you coming, and, and hopefully you'll get your check uh, one of these days. I guess Canada Post will do it quick. We usually are handing this over at a, at a, a live event in downtown Toronto. Um, you know, so again, congratulations to this year's winning authors, Clayton Gauthier and, and Drew Hayden Taylor, for the important contributions both authors continue to make to the Indigenous literature in Canada. Finally, I'd like to express sincere thanks to Nancy Cooper. Nancy does a lot of work on this. Uh, in the background, and, and and the group of librarians who get together and vote, read all these books, vote on them, and everything else, um, and our, our partners at the Southern Ontario Library Service. That's who, that's who's reading all the books and judging, uh, and members of our judging panel in the Toronto virtual world on the Street Festival organizers for allowing us to participate in today's program. Finally, just a quick uh, thank you to Barry Francis, who is our executive director of the Periodical Markers of Canada, who helps us coordinate all this and keeps us uh, together and, and keeps us, helps us to support a great uh, reading cause in supporting Indigenous authors and Indigenous literature. So uh, uh, thanks to everyone for that. Uh, over to you, Nancy, for final comments. Okay, Miigwech, Peter. That was a really wonderful half hour listening to stories and uh, hearing about people's lives. I've known Drew for... Uh, well, I'm not going to say how long, but um, we've been friends for a while. And I've just recently met Clayton, and I'm really, really honored to have him in my life. Um, so, again, I want to thank everybody watching for um, helping us support First Nation Communities Read and the Periodical Marketers of Canada's Indigenous Literature Award. 
For the First Nation Communities Read nominated titles, you can go over to goodminds.com and purchase any of them. If you want to find out more about First Nation Communities Read, you can go to souls.org. And with that, I wish you a great afternoon, chi miigwech, and bama pi, which means until we'll see each other again. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Nancy, Clayton, Peter, Drew. That was really lovely. Um, Drew, I don't know how you managed to write so many books. That's 33 more books than I've ever written in my lifetime. Um, and Clayton, that song was very beautiful. So congratulations to both of you. Um, in terms of our stream, thank you so much for today's hosts, uh, Jeff Spurglass, Carrie Lynn Winters, Nancy Cooper, and all of our great readers and our friends at First Nation Communities Read. Don't forget to visit Elemento Bookstore and Good Binds to find all the books by this weekend's featured authors. If you're looking for more, pro more programming for kids and teens, please visit our friends at the Telling Tales Festival at tellingtales.org. The word on the street is funded in part by the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. We acknowledge the support of the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Council, and the Toronto Arts Council in, and Ontario Creates. <laughs> Ce projet est financé en partie par le gouvernement du Canada, le gouvernement de l'Ontario et la ville de Toronto. Thank you for joining us and um, thank you so much for this festival. It's been great and that wraps up our kids and teen stream.